kick things off today. Um, good afternoon and welcome to day one of the Breed Collaborative Behavioral Health Implementation Summit. Uh, participate in our word poll as we are kicking things off today. I'm Amy Etzel, Implementation Manager with the Breed Collaborative. We're so excited to have you here with us today and thankful to you for dedicating an entire afternoon during these very strange and busy times and to spend a few hours with us. We also really appreciate your patience over the last few months as the date shifted multiple times and thank you for bearing with us as we navigated into finding today's date and, and virtual format. Before we begin, a few necessary housekeeping announcements. NQAC will accept attendance at this webinar session as a CE event to receive 3.3 credits. You need to document your time and submit a short survey. You'll receive an email later this week with a link to the survey along with a recording of today's presentation, relevant slides and resources. Please remember that if you want a certificate for a credit for these credit hours, you must provide either your license number or an equivalent ID number. If you have questions about this, please contact NQAC directly. Today's speakers declare no affiliation with or financial interest in a commercial organization that could pose a conflict of interest with the educational content of this program. We also want to thank you in advance for your patience and understanding and grace for any technical issues we may experience, any kids or dogs that you may hear in the background. This is a, this is a new endeavor for us with such a large crowd and so there may be some, some clunky moments and we thank you for understanding if and when we hit moments like that. We have a really exciting agenda today. The agenda is attached to the meeting invitation you received yesterday for your reference throughout the day. We'll start off with some welcome remarks from the other Brie Collaborative partners, Hugh Straley, Collaborative Chair, and Ginny Weir, Director of the Brie. And then we'll move in to hear from Carrie Rose and Dan Brie, children of Dr. Robert Brie, for whom this collaborative was formed in honor of and to honor and remember his legacy. We'll then hear from Representative Eileen Cody, one of the Breeze champions down in Olympia and esteemed chair of the State House Health and Wellness Committee. We'll also hear from our partners with the AIM Center and some of their partners to learn about some new and innovative ways to deliver integrated care in the COVID-19 era. We'll then also hear from our healthcare authority leadership, Sue Birch and Judy Zerzan, on the healthcare authority perspective around the Bree and how we work together. And then we'll move into our largest presentation for the day from Cody Russell with Kitsap Strong on trauma-informed care and what helps all people flourish, which is obviously such an important topic for the work that we all do. And then we'll have some closing remarks from Ginny. With so many wonderful speakers, it was hard to get enough breaks worked into our agenda. And so we fully encourage people to get up, go to the bathroom, stretch, et cetera, while you're listening to our presentations throughout the day. Just as an FYI, you are all currently on mute and will be throughout the day. During each presentation, please feel free to write a question into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. The meeting invitation that you received also has Zoom instructions attached to it with some detailed technical instructions on how to ask a question and what to do if you're experiencing technical issues. In short, um, please, an please enter any questions for our speakers into the Q&A box and any technical issues into the chat box. I will be monitoring the Q&A throughout the day and there will be time after each presentation to go through these. And then Alex Kushner, our resident tech guru, he'll be monitoring the chat box and should help. he'll be able to help you with any technical issues that come up. Um, and then a note to our panelists and speakers for the day, Alex will also be promoting you in Zoom to co-panelists when your portion of the agenda comes. Um, you'll automatically be on mute on your end, so you'll need to unmute yourself before you begin. He will then move you back to attendee status after your presentation, and you'll see a pop-up come up, and it will look like you're being kicked out of the summit, but I assure you, you are not. Okay, um, all the housekeeping that we've done. So let's dive into our day. Before I hand it over to our collaborative chair, Hugh Straley, I wanted to share a quote that's been on my mind recently. As some of you who have been in meetings with me over the last few months know, I often like to start off with a reflection. I'm just a little bit cheesy like that. Um, so I wanted to share a short quote from James Baldwin that I'm sure you've heard before and likely heard a lot recently. Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. 
we, we as a country and we as medical and public health professional communities face these, these two current crises of a new health pandemic and the old ever present issue of systemic racism, both overt and covert racism. And I just have been thinking a lot about this idea of, of the work it takes to, to truly see and recognize and welcome that self-reflection that's so necessary to actually make change within our everyday actions and the actions of the organizations we represent. We'll be diving deeper into this idea in day two of our summit next week, the idea of how to how to truly nurture growth and progress. And I'm excited for today's agenda to set us up for that ultimate goal of making true and meaningful change. So let's think about that as we look back today at the origins of the BRI and the current work of the BRI and our partners and think about the potential that exists for all of us to instill change and progress into our work and to take an honest look at our actions through that broader scope and lens and depth of understanding. And we really thank you for, for joining us in this journey today and hopefully joining us again next week in day two of our summit to continue this conversation. Okay, um, now I'll turn it over to Hugh Straley, Bree Collaborative Chair, to say a few words. Thank you, Amy. Um, thank you for uh, those words as well. Uh, quite relevant for today. Um, so welcome to, I think we have over 200 uh, uh, registered. And so this is a big day, uh, an innovative way to uh, share our learnings and to uh, promote uh, behavioral health integration. Um, and this is the first of two summits. So we'll meet again uh, next week for uh, the second uh, day of that. I've been with the Bree since 2015, and uh, almost at every meeting, I say how proud I am of participating in this uh, statewide uh, collaborative effort to improve uh, healthcare and promote uh, innovation. And I think now uh, more than ever, we, we know how important uh, innovation and improvement is to address all the flaws that have been exposed by what, what is being called the perfect storm of uh, pandemic and uh, economic recession, and then this universal protest uh, for Black Lives Matter. I wanna, again, thank everybody for being here. Uh, it is uh, the appropriate time for us to uh, address the flaws that exist in our system and uh, to come out of this stronger than uh, we had ever been. So I'm, I'm hoping that uh, we can uh, uh, take action from uh, uh, our learnings from this meeting. So. Thank you for participating, and uh, I look forward to uh, the rest of the afternoon. Jeannie. Thank you, Hugh. So a warm virtual welcome to everybody. I like to think of the, the BRI as really a diagnostician for our healthcare system, one that really takes the input of all these different players, often those who compete against each other, identifies the problem and then helps to identify a solution that's really acceptable to at least the majority of people around the table. And we really strive to be informed by clinical evidence. And we also know that there's a limit to clinical research. And that limit's really based on who and for whom the clinical research is done. So we really try to acknowledge that too, as we build an evidence-informed uh, justification for the recommendations that we do. So I also want everybody to keep in mind changes that they want to make within their organizations today. Uh, and we will have a more in-depth discussion, as Amy said, on our um, next Tuesday's summit. We'll really ask people to work on action plans. So it is now my honor to introduce Carrie Rose and Dan Bree, family of our namesake, Dr. Robert Bree, uh, who will be followed by Representative Eileen Cody of the 34th District, my district, and Amy's as well. We are proud members of our island in West Seattle. Um, so we also ask that you please go into speaker view at the top right to make this a little bit easier to, to see our faces as we try to connect in this virtual space. So I will now turn this over to Carrie and Dan. Thank you, Jenny. And thank you, Dr. Straley and Amy. It's a real honor to be here. Thank you for the invitation. My name is uh, Carrie Rose. I am Dr. Robert Bree's daughter and like him, I'm a physician. I practice family medicine at Pacific Medical Center. When I sat down to think about this event, about the Brie Collaborative and about my father's legacy, I started thinking about my daughter, Bob's beloved granddaughter, Gabby. 
an 18 year old freshman at the University of Washington. Since the death of George Floyd and the start of the Black Lives Matter protests a few weeks ago, she has been talking nonstop about ways to combat racism in society and in ourselves and her current strategies to fix it. She is opinionated as only an 18 year old can be. She's passionate and most importantly, she believes that if we all do our part to become anti-racist, the system will change. She believes in her own power to change a deeply entrenched system. When I talk to Gabby, I am so reminded of my father. His passion to point out where change needs to happen and to believe in his own power, even if in his own responsibility to make that change is the passion that birthed Debris Collaborative. And as he was the person who gave inspiration and his name to the Brie Collaborative, my brother and I want to give you a sense of who my father was and why I believe the work you're doing in his name is so important. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Dan Bree. Um, I'm Robert Bree's son and unlike him, I'm an executive producer for nonfiction television shows in Los Angeles, uh, not a doctor, but I couldn't be more proud of my father and his life, career and legacy. Bob Bree was born in 1943 in Philadelphia. He grew up there and in rural New Jersey. His father was a veterinarian and his mother was at home with him and his siblings. While my father was an undergrad at Muhlenberg College, my grandfather made a mid-career shift into academic medical research and he moved his whole family to Ann Arbor. My father fell in love with the University of Michigan and elected to attend medical school there. He graduated in 1966 and newly married to Jackie, went on to complete his residency in radiology before specializing in ultrasound, which at the time was a relatively new field. His career took him around the country from Phoenix, Arizona to Biloxi, Mississippi, to Houston, Texas, to Toledo, Ohio, and then Detroit, Michigan. He made a mid-career turn into academic medicine and spent years at the University of Michigan Medical Center. He became chairman of the Department of Radiology at the University of Missouri before a final move to Seattle to be closer to my sister and his grandchildren, Gabby and Ben. He worked at Radia before moving to the University of Washington, primarily practicing at Harborview Medical Center. Robert Bree's career highlights, in short, are amazing. During his 42-year career as a radiologist, he received 23 grants, including eight from the National Institutes of Health. He wrote 97 peer-reviewed publications and nine book chapters, and presented more than 200 invited lectures around the globe. He was a world recognized expert in ultrasound and much of his work was dedicated to advancing the field of ultrasonography. My father was involved with all of the major radiology and ultrasound organizations. He was on the board of the SRU, a fellow in the ACR and the chairman of committees for the RSNA and the AIUM. I'm not gonna explain well what all those acronyms stand for, but trust me, they're all prestigious radiology organizations. A colleague of his once remarked to my sister and me that Bob was a giant in the field of radiology and I think anyone who knew him or his work would agree and that's true. My father, Dr. Robert Bree, was a brilliant academic physician, an amazing colleague to collaborate with, and a hell of a great, kind, and patient father to grow up with. But his impact goes far beyond the family he raised and beyond the thousands of patients that he served throughout his career the hundreds of residents that he trained, and his impact in the field of ultrasound. Perhaps most importantly, throughout his career, Bob was a visionary in challenging the status quo. While he was a radiologist, advanced medical imaging in the form of CT and MRI took its place in the heart of radiology. And he witnessed an explosion in the use of these scans during the height of his career. But even though this increased usage of imaging promised to bring revenue to his own specialty of radiology, he began to question it, both from a cost and a patient safety perspective. I remember in the 90s, as I graduated college, he advised me against going into medicine. He saw it heading in a direction he didn't approve of. But rather than, than despair about that direction, he shifted gears into finding ways to fix the problems he saw. Those were the years when he developed an interest in what would later become utilization management, basically finding ways to lower costs and improve care by reducing unnecessary medical procedures, which is, as you know, in essence, the mission of the Brie Collaborative today. 
But back then, it was the start for him on the road to becoming a change agent in medicine. He wanted to improve medicine, and he wholeheartedly believed that he could. Carrie? During that time when my father was studying utilization management, I was doing my residency here in Seattle. We got into a lot of deba debates about the overuse of imaging. No question we saw things differently. Me from the perspective of the ordering physician and him sitting in the reading room wondering, what is she thinking? These conversations did bring us closer and I know we learned a great deal from each other. I even took to relying on him as my decision support when ordering imaging. By the time my parents moved to Seattle around 17 years ago, Bob had moved out of academic medicine and back into private practice, reading films, including hundreds of CTs and MRIs. He was already thinking about retirement and he could have just relaxed and played with his grandchildren, but that was not him. He cared deeply about patients and about medicine. He saw patients who would get multiple CT scans in a year. He read films that he knew couldn't answer the clinical question being asked. The overuse of imaging continued to bother him. He did go back into academic medicine a few years later, mainly working at Harborview. One of my favorite stories about him was from his time there. He told me that his department chair had talked to him about some phone calls that he was making. Basically, he would call up an ordering physician and question the imaging order. He would try to understand the clinical question so he could make sure it was the right test. It was unusual behavior to be sure, and he didn't make too many friends this way. Eventually, he was called into the principal's office, meaning he got in trouble for not just approving and reading the test that the ordering doctor requested. That would have been the easier thing to do, but that wasn't my father's way. That period is when he began working with legislators like Representative Eileen Cody on the Advanced Imaging Management or AIM work group. He was starting to harness his energy and passion around utilization management into something that could really bring about systemic change. He was, in, he was an incredibly disciplined and hard worker, and in this endeavor, like with everything else in his life, he just got things done. My father had a brilliant life and career, but when we talk about his legacy, it's hard for me not to speak about his death. On September 1st, 2010, at the age of 66, he died from suicide. The reason I think this needs to be talked about is that physicians have a rate of suicide that's almost twice that of the general population. A physician dies every day in the United States due to suicide. That's the equivalent of an entire medical school class every year. I'm sure every doctor listening knows a physician who has taken his or her own life. I certainly know many. Physician suicide is a public health crisis. If we're going to talk about changing the practice of medicine to improve the delivery of care, we have to talk about the mental health crisis among those that are responsible for providing that care. Physicians don't come into the profession with higher rates of mental health problems. First year medical students actually have a lower rate of anxiety and depression than the general population. Yet medical students as a whole have a rate of suicide that is three times higher than their peers in other professions. We are in a system that drives physicians to work as hard as we can, selflessly, without complaint, to the point of burnout. We do not provide a supportive atmosphere for talking about how hard it can be to do this job. As physicians, we must be to name the problem of physician burnout and suicide, to talk about it without fearing for our licenses and our livelihood. I choose to honor my father by talking about his death openly in the hopes of changing medicine so that I don't continue to lose friends and colleagues to suicide. I'm hoping for a culture that supports happy, healthy doctors. Dr. Simon Talbot, a surgeon at Brigham and Women's Hospital wrote, physicians are smart, tough, resourceful people. If there was a way to MacGyver themselves out of this situation by working harder, smarter, or differently, they would have done it already. I'm so heartened by all the incredible accomplishments of the Brie Collaborative over the last decade since my father's death. And by shining a spotlight on suicide prevention and mental health parity, you're bringing much needed attention to these topics. I wonder about the impact the Brie Collaborative might have by directing its attention as well to physician suicide. You've already established yourselves as a powerful voice for change in medicine. Physician suicide is a complex topic, but the Brie has shown it can tackle complicated and multifaceted problems in a thoughtful and systematic way. 
My brother and I are so grateful to be given the opportunity to speak to all of you and to thank you for everything you've done to carry on my father's legacy. Every time we hear about the work of the Dr. Robert Brief Collaborative, we know he would be honored by all the re remarkable work that's being done in his name. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carrie, and thank you, Dan. Now I will turn it over to Representative Eileen Cody. Thanks, Jenny. And thank you, Carrie and Dan, for your comments. Uh, as you know, I knew your dad uh, pretty well. Uh, he also was a constituent of the 34th, lived only a few blocks from me during the time that he would come down and work on the issue of uh, the advanced imaging. And uh, quite often he would be walking through the neighborhood looking for me, I think, to make sure that he could lobby me on the issue. Uh, but he didn't give up easily, I will just phrase it that way. Uh, Actually, it would probably be more amusing to bring the lobbyist for the radiologist into this conversation because he had lots of stories of how your dad would push him and tell him how he should be doing his job. Uh, but it was, you know, back in, we managed to pass the bill about advanced imaging back in 2009. And even though the work on that uh, didn't come up with exactly, I think, what your dad wanted, uh, we, it did bring forth the idea of having docs join together and trying to have an implementation and bring in evidence-based medicine into the practice more. So uh, it was at the end of the uh, advanced imaging that actually it was a, another one of the physicians had said to me, we'll keep our feet to the fire, even though we didn't get everything done what we should have done. And you know, you, anytime a doctor tells me to keep their feet to the fire as a nurse, I'm more than happy to do that. So uh, we, we worked on the legislation in 2011 to uh, continue the work of, of, and named it the Bree Collaborative at that time. And really the focus as I'm sure many of you know, it has been to look at where we have substantial variation in practice across the state and also where uh, we can bring in more evidence-based medicine and improve the outcomes and not be wasting our money on things that actually uh, do not increase or improve uh, outcomes where we have poor quality and, and potential waste or where we have also seen high utilization and maybe not great outcomes. Uh, I, as I look at what the BRI has done in the last 10 years, it's pretty amazing because I know how little money the legislature has given to the BRI uh, to do work. And I have to thank everybody that's been active on the BRI Collaborative, all of the the healthcare providers, the physicians, and, and uh, others that have been on the collaborative because we don't pay you for this. And I recognize that it's an all volunteer effort and it speaks highly for, what, for the people that are involved and the work you've done. Uh, and I, I have to say, I greatly appreciate it. And in some ways, I think you're almost, uh, your success is beginning to be too good because as you probably have recognized, there have been different bills in the legislature over the past few years where we try to assign you what you should do rather than let the Bree Collaborative choose themselves. I, I try to keep an eye on that. Sometimes it slips by me, I will tell you, uh, but uh, I'll, I'll encourage you to make sure that you point it out when it's happening and to not necessarily just, just say yes because you think it's the most politically exp expeditious thing to do. Uh, but I, I do, again, want to thank everybody for the work they've done and encourage those of you that aren't that familiar with the Brie to go onto their website and see some of the work they've done over the last 10 years. It's really quite remarkable. I think that in the future, what I want, would like to see us be able to do is actually improve the uptake in the private sector. That is one of the issues that worries me the most. Uh, that we had hopes that everybody would jump right on the bandwagon with the work that was being done here. And there's slow progress, but that's one of the things that, that uh, I think we really need to try and push on. And if I can figure out how to do that legislatively, I'll try. Uh, so, but with that, just again, thank you for all the work you do and, uh, and will do in the future. Thank you, Representative Cody. Appreciate your being here. So now 
we, we're going to shift gears a little bit uh, to talk about behavioral health and telehealth, this virtual space in which we are all spending so much of our time. So the Brie is really lucky to share our state and also this stage with the advanced <laughs> Sorry, Advancing Integrated Mental Health Solutions or AIMS Center. A lot of acronyms uh, floating around right now at the University of Washington. The AIMS Center was really pivotal in helping us develop our recommendations around integrating behavioral health into primary care. And they really are a leader statewide. So I am very happy to introduce Diane Powers, co-director of the AIM Center, and Sarah Barker, assistant director of implementation. And they will lead us through a discussion on the role of telehealth and behavioral health. So Sarah, Diane, I will turn it over to you. All right, great. Thank you so much. I'm just trying to figure out how to share my slides, Amy. I tried clicking on share and it says that it's disabled. You're muted, Amy. Thank you for that. Um, okay, let me see. I am changing the settings to allow all panelists to share the screen. So you should be able to now. All right, let's share. Apologies for that. Okay. Can you see them now? Yes, we can. All right, great. Well, thank you so much, um, Amy and Jenny, for having us today. We're really excited to be here to talk about innovations and workflows around behavioral health integration, particularly during this time of COVID-19. There's been a lot of innovation I've been learning about in Washington State and around the country, and we're excited to bring you um, some work that's happening here in Washington in a panel discussion about that. Um, so um, I am Sarah Barker, the Assistant Director for Implementation at the AIMS Center, I'm also joined by Diane Powers, our um, co-director at the AIMS Center. Um, we work around training and technical assistance around integrated care, whole person care strategies in Washington State and um, around the country. Um, so today we're really, um, we're really going to take those, um, the be behavioral health um, integration recommendations that came out of the Brie Collaborative and look at ways health systems are really innovating around those recommendations during this time. We're gonna talk about ways that folks are engaging patients um, and outreaching to patients in different ways. Um, the uptake of telehealth, I think during this time has been just amazing to see and we're gonna hear from folks about that. We're also gonna hear about um, new patterns and shifting ways of around workflow, around screening. Um, and how folks are thinking about using data to proactively outreach um, to, to patients during this time. I think many of you have seen these um, statistics and graphs from the Washington State Department of Health. Um, I know back in March, um, the American Psychiatric Association did a survey and they found that and they found that 36% of the respondents said that COVID-19 is seriously affecting their mental health. Some of the projections I know in Washington State from the Department of Health have said that approximately 2 million people in Washington could experience behavioral health symptoms such as acute stress, anxiety, depression currently and in the coming months. And what we don't know is depending on the waves of the virus and things may change and this, these projections may change as well. We shouldn't forget to the, you know, approximately half of those individuals experiencing a behavioral health diagnosis will also develop some sort of substance related disorder. And so this work around integrated care is more important, I think, than ever um, during this time. Just to put them up there, um, the Brie Collaborative's Behavioral Health Integration Recommendations, I think we can really, I think these have really set us up well to both respond right now to both the acute and more long-term behavioral health needs that we're seeing in our communities across Washington State. Um, I know practices that are on the call today and around the state have really been finding innovative ways to develop their integrated care teams embedding behavioral health clinicians into primary care finding ways to, um, to better improve access to psychiatry 
changing workflows, thinking about better ways to communicate between primary care and behavioral health, um, finding and figuring out what the ev best evidence-based treatment is. Is it medication? Is it psychotherapy? What's the best approach that our patients need? Um, involving the patient early in the process and really using data around access and quality outcomes for behavioral health to help drive improvement. At the AIMS Center, when we talk about the BRI recommendations, we, um, we often also talk about the collaborative care principles, and they're really very much the same to us. Um, and the one difference, and we'll hear from Diana in a minute, who will talk more about collaborative care, is the one around um, psychiatry. So when we think about the BRI recommendations, it's a little bit broader around access to psychiatry. And with collaborative care, a key piece of collaborative care is the psychiatric caseload review process. All right, Diane? Okay, great. Thanks, Sarah. So this graphic shows the, the collaborative care model. And if you look in the upper middle graphic, uh, collaborative care adds two team members to the existing primary care dyad of the patient and primary care provider. Um, these two members are a behavioral health care manager and a psychiatric consultant, as Sarah just said. The behavioral health care manager is often a master's level provider, though the role can be shared by a licensed provider and a non-licensed provider like a medical assistant, a community health worker, or a navigator. The behavioral health care manager engages patients in treatment, participates in treatment planning, uses validated symptom measures to track clinical outcomes, provides evidence-based behavioral treatments, I mean, uses a registry to keep track of all the patients who are engaged in care. The psychiatric consultant is typically a psychiatrist or a psychiatric nurse practitioner. This person participates in a weekly caseload consultation with the behavioral health care manager that uses the registry to focus on patients who are not improving and make treatment recommendations to the primary care provider and the behavioral health care manager. The psychiatric consultant rarely sees patients directly. Next slide, Sarah. Use of the telephone has always been a recommended part of collaborative care since the model was first developed more than 25 years ago. Using the telephone can be convenient for patients and provides an opportunity to, for more frequent contact um, and follow-ups than may be possible when all of the contact is, office, uh, is based in office visits. Um, one of the key components of collaborative care is frequent follow-up that drives uh, treatment toward a more proactive uh, manner. Televideo is a natural extension of that approach. Next slide, Sarah. So practice-based collaborative care uses behavioral health care managers who are located in the primary care setting and who use both in-person and telephone-based contact with patients. Psychiatric consultants are frequently off-site using the registry to organize their weekly caseload consultation. There's very strong evidence for this approach. There's also emerging evidence for exclusively off-site telephone and televideo collaborative care. While the evidence for this approach is mixed, trials by John Fortney, who's here at the University of Washington and who led four of the eight trials that are mentioned here, show that televideo collaborative care was as effective as practice-based care, especially in rural clinics. And a recent trial that he's conducting um, and that was just concluded shows this approach is also equally effective for patients with bipolar disorder and PTSD. Next slide. Both the Breed Collaborative and the AIM Center focus on principles that guide integration of behavioral health services into primary care. And in both cases, clinics have latitude in determining how to most effectively implement those principles in their setting. Next slide. We've invited uh, two people to serve as panelists with us this afternoon. We thought it would be most helpful to hear from your colleagues and folks who are out in the field about how they're adapting their workflows and their practices um, to deal with COVID-19. Uh, we are going to be joined by Bonnie Holdall. She's Behavioral Health Program Manager at Kaiser Permanente. She has more than 10 years experience in healthcare leadership focused on service delivery of mental health and substance use disorder, treatment for Medicaid patients in the Portland and Southwest Washington areas. Bonnie has spent the last year supporting Kaiser Permanente's efforts in behavioral health integration into primary care. Jennifer Fadden is an Assistant Director of Behavioral Health for Valley View Health Center, an FQHC in the Centralia, Chehalis, and Olympia area. 
In addition to administrative responsibilities, she also sees clients at the clinic as they believe people in management positions need to keep their therapy skills and learning up to date. She has a master's degree in marriage and family therapy from Pacific Lutheran University. So we are going to hear from both of them um, and from these two diverse health systems about their experiences adapting to COVID-19. Next slide, Sarah. So this first question really asks uh, about what your care looks like today um, in the context of COVID-19. And uh, Bonnie, can we start with you? Sure. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Great. Yeah, so um, just to, as you were describing the, the Brie Collaborative and the Collaborative Care, I just wanted to sort of talk a little bit more broadly about what Kaiser's um, system sort of looks like, although we may not ascribe specifically to, um, you know, the model. We use a lot of the same terminology and we use a lot of the same teammates in the care. And so what it really broadly looks like at Kaiser in primary care is we've got our primary care clinician, our behavioral health consultant is what we call them, or BHC as I may refer to them um, as we chat. And then we also have a, um, a psychiatric consult service, not on site, not embedded inside the team in person, but um, we have what's called a mind phone and we use um, consultative services when needed for our patients. So that's kind of what that team looks like, very similar to what you described, just maybe again, kind of a little bit different terminology and different look to it. Um, Right now, uh, since we have kind of shifted into virtual care um, due to COVID, what that's looking like on that team is, uh, you know, really, frankly, we got kind of lucky in a way. So um, our behavioral health consultants have always had the option of providing either telephone or video visits for patients. Um, it wasn't the majority of, of services, but it was an option. And so the kind of cultural transition into that care uh, was a little bit, I think, maybe easier for us than, than for other systems. Um, and so BHCs are really providing 90% of their care um, over the phone or over video visits right now. And, you know, for us, patients are um, largely speaking pretty well engaged. Um, you know, we've got uh, same day access to our BHCs um, when needed. So the primary care provider can message the behavioral health consultant and ask them to you know, come in on a visit or to see a patient on the same day. Um, our back office staff, like our medical assistants or some other registered nurse type care management staff who's around also um, can schedule with our BHCs. And so we've got a nice level of access to those behavioral health consultants that has remained, um, even though it's been virtual, we've been, we've had kind of an ease in, in that way, which has been really nice. I think for us, what we were most concerned about was you know, those patients kind of transitioning from one level of care to another. So maybe coming out of a maybe sort of higher level of care in back into their normal primary care setting and um, those folks who we may be missing um, in, in, you know, this current climate. So we um, started to utilize a um, a registry for, you know, for identifying those patients. And, and I think we'll sort of talk about that a little bit later, but we were just really more concerned about those folks who were, maybe we were potentially missing. So the, the people that weren't engaging in that care. So what it's looking like now, um, and I think, yeah, we'll, we'll sort of get to there, um, but it's really looking like we're using those BHCs for that same day access and for that virtual care. Great, thanks, Bonnie. How about you, Jennifer? Hi, yeah, so um, our model um, is pretty integrative. We do use uh, a different um, title for uh, the, the care manager. We basically say BH therapist. Um, but we our, our main clinic in Chehalis, we have um, our medical providers, BH providers, dental providers, and pharmacy all in one building on site. So when kind of in the before times, <laughs> um, we were all in the same building together and it was very easy to collaborate and do warm connects and that kind of stuff. Um, I think we were really lucky because right when we heard that Snohomish County was going into a lockdown, um, our behavioral health team and our CEO, Galen Spradley, um, we started discussing what is that's gonna look like if it happens to us, which eventually it did, we went into lockdown. Um, but we started planning for the telehealth needs ahead of time. So we ordered laptops for our providers because none of our behavioral health providers had laptops at the time um, and got everybody quickly set up um, either with Doxy Me 
or Zoom so that you know we could do our telehealth videos. Um, I think what was interesting is as, as the lockdown kept going, we actually found that most of our clients preferred phone sessions, um, either on the phone or even doing Zoom or Doxy through the phone. But being that they were in lockdown with a lot of family members or maybe friends, um, they wanted privacy for their sessions, obviously. And the best way they could get that was like by going out to the car <laughs> to do their session. We've had some go out to their barns. Those were some interesting, you know, with cows mooing in the background. Um, but it's it's been a really interesting learning curve. And, that, and you know, we're very excited because now um, you know, we do have some really rural areas um, that we feel we can serve as better with telehealth going forward. So this has been a really good experience for us. Um, <clears throat> we do um, have weekly consults with our psychiatrist, Dr. Turner, up at UW. So that didn't really change much because we were already doing phone consults with him and telehealth, like he calls them tellies, <laughs> with clients if he wants to put eyes on the client. So that really hasn't changed much as far as that goes. Um, and we did, I wasn't, yeah, we did um, also, I think we're talking about this later though, so I'll save that, the on-call thing. <laughs> so I'll save that for later. Yeah. Great, thanks both of you. Sarah, do you wanna take over? All right, we do have a couple additional questions for our panelists here. Um, let me see if I can advance, there we go. Um, so it's great to hear about both of your programs and how quickly you've had to adapt. Um, we know that these workflows have really changed very quickly. Um, traditionally, you know, the primary care team screens patients for behavioral health conditions. Often there's a warm connection or warm handoff to that embedded behavioral health clinicians. So wondering about how some of these workflows um, have changed um, for your teams. Um, Bonnie, you wanna tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So we were able to um, start sending our, our questionnaires and our screening tools um, to our patients online. So we've got, you know, our kp.org platform that we can use to send GAD anxiety screeners or um, PHQ-9 questionnaires to patients. If patients don't have access to that level of um, yep, technology, we, we always just ask those questions over the over the visit, the video visit, whether that's video or phone, to kind of assess progress and see, you know, how are things going? How, how is the patient doing? Um, I think Jen had kind of uh, mentioned this in her comment about the rural population. It's, it's been interesting to sort of see the the two sides of that, which is a, our rural patients are engaging more because they have the option to, um, you know, access services over the phone or video, and then b, because technology is a challenge for folks who are out, they have had a harder time, um, and so that's just been tricky to to navigate. But if you know they don't have access to an internet kind of service or at least a reliable one to fill out those questionnaires, we're just doing that over the phone with them or over the video visit, so we can just track on their progress. Um, and we've also kind of started a, what I think is pretty interesting um, new piece uh, since COVID has started related to just asking patients a couple of screening questions, pretty simple screening questions, not just about their symptomology for COVID, but about their level of distress about it. So really you don't have to have any symptoms um, uh, physically um, towards uh, the, the virus to really just be concerned about it or maybe have some um, escalating issues with your behavioral health that might need to be addressed. And we're asking those as well so we can triage patients appropriately. Maybe they need to go to a BHC right away. Maybe they need even more than that. You know, maybe they need to reconnect with um, some other behavioral health treatment that they were receiving before or, um, or something like that. So we've been trying really hard to screen patients, um, not only in the kind of typical ways, uh, using PHQ-9 and GAD and those sorts of things, but really thinking about what are people thinking and feeling in this very unique moment mm -hmm. that is causing them potentially some decompensation in what was a existing behavioral health issue or underlying behavioral health issue that we can try to catch before it gets worse and before they maybe need to access emergency department or they call the crisis line or something like that occurs where they're using kind of a really high level of care. Um, and so that's been really unique and really interesting to, to see. We're calling it caring calls. Um, maybe some other folks on the phone are from the Washington uh, KP region, you know, we're sort of different regions, of course, um, just to make things more complicated. 
and uh, they might be using the same, you know, the same kind of idea. And it's been, it's been really great to, to just be, um, to be part of, of a sort of a system that, yeah, has been kind of thinking a little bit more about that and been thinking about how COVID um, affects people, even though they might not be having those physical symptoms or might not be positive even for the virus. So yeah, that's how we've been managing that. Great. And who provide, who does those calls, Bonnie, the Karen calls? Yeah, so the caring calls was actually on a volunteer basis. So we just asked staff at KP, um, do you have time and bandwidth? Some folks who were working from home did. And uh, can we just send you a list of patients to reach out to and say, hi, we're thinking about you. How are you doing? Um, is there anything you need? Even if something came up for them, like a food insecurity issue or um, another kind of social determinant of health type of thing, we, we, we were able to provide resource lists and um, connection to that. So a little bit outside of primary care, but um, certainly related and, and certainly impacts the whole system. So it was actually a, um, KP staff sort of just layperson volunteer thing. Great. Thanks for sharing that. Jen, how about you? Um, well, I, I don't know if I have much more to add to what Bonnie was saying. I mean, our primary care providers have always used um, the GAD and, PH, and PHQ to screen um, when they have patients coming in. Um, and they continue to do that through their telehealth uh, visits. So um, we, we're not currently mailing out anything. And so the medical providers have been asking the questions in their telehealth visits or over the phone. And that's the same with our behavioral health providers. We've just been asking the questions and going through them. Um, and it's really actually been interesting because I've gotten more positive feedback from my clients about when I'm actually asking the questions instead of them just filling out the paper you know, before a session. Um, they really like being able to expand a little bit more on some of the questions, so that's been really helpful. Um, and then also what we did, uh, just to kind of keep the warm connect thing going for our patients and our medical team, was that we created um, an on-call uh, uh, providers. So our BH providers, we had three assigned to each day, Monday through Friday, um, and every Monday we send that list out to all of Valley View. Um, and that way the providers can contact us or they could contact our um, front office staff, get a hold of us so we could then contact the clients and do a warm connect with them. Um, and then we also made it available for our, em our employees as well because I know that they've been under extra stress in this time. So from like 6 to 7.30, our BH providers were available for any of our employees to be able to call us and just get like a support call, not really therapy, but just um, trying to be there as a support system for them and see, you know, ch kind of check in, see how they're doing and making sure they're doing okay. So, um, and that's been really great. We've had positive feedback on, on that whole on-call um, setup that we did. So, great. yeah. How does that virtually, how does that warm connect look like for those providers that are on call? Um, how, how does that happen? Well, actually, it's right now, it, what, what we did was just phone calls. So it was really talking to the client. Um, we would get a briefing from the, the PCP beforehand. So we kind of knew what we were, you know, looking for um, and what to discuss with the patient. Uh, so it was mainly phone calls that we've been doing, um, describing the program, letting them know, you know, about our integration and how that works. Um, and then trying to get, especially if they were in crisis, trying to get them scheduled for an appointment right away. So um, yeah, it's a little bit different than when we're in person, but, uh, um, but it, it's been working well, so. Good to hear, great. Just uh, one clarification, Jen, um, what kind of uptake have you had on the services that you're offering to your employees? Um, do, you, do you mean how much are they using it? Yeah. Um, we've had maybe five, on average a week. Um, we do have the EAP as well. So I think some of them feel more comfortable using the EAP uh, instead of, you know, contacting another, you know, coworker basically. Um, but we have had um, average about three to five a week and, and they're pretty quick. They're just kind of checking in with them, seeing how they're doing. I know in the past couple of weeks with other events that have been going on, that has been kind of an uptick. We've definitely had more employees um, wanting a little more support. So. Thank you. Yeah. 
All right. Um, so this gets to kind of the population based care, the use of um, data and registries to help proactively engage patients. Um, this question does. So just curious kind of ways you're using your EHR or maybe a registry to reach out to patients and engage them. Bonnie, you want to start again? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a, a community health navigator um, and we uh, have a registry sort of dedicated to, to them and, and them working that, that registry for patients. We actually started that uh, several months ago and it was dedicated solely to patients who were using um, medication to treat opioid use disorder in primary care. So it was a little bit of a niche kind of registry that we started out with and then have since expanded and actually added additional navigator staff to really work the registry and, and continue to monitor it. So essentially we, we use that as a way to outreach. We pay attention to are there patients on the registry who maybe haven't been seen in a number of months, maybe their last refill wasn't picked up if they are using a medication, um, perhaps their last urine drug screen was unfavorable, um, how can we reach out to them and sort of check in on them and see how they're doing. Um, you know, of course, we talk about behavioral health broadly, but I think the, the particularly insidious you know, situation right now is that substance use disorder is really the opposite of COVID. It, it thrives in isolation and it tends to sort of die in social settings. And so we're very concerned that we, we are going to see a real rise in substance use disorder um, need and, and potential return to use for people who were in periods of recovery before. So we wanted to pay particular attention to that population who were being managed in primary care. So, you know, typically when they were being managed in primary care, it meant they were fairly stable before and, you know, doing okay. And most of them will continue in that way and that's fine, but we want to make sure that we're not kind of letting those others fall through the cracks. So that's how we're using that registry and have really tried to expand it in the past several months to, to additional patients in need of behavioral health services. So for example, a patient who maybe in February was in an intensive outpatient program for a behavioral health concern, but was now, you know, had, had left that program and was now kind of back to their, to the regular milieu of life. Um, how might we reach out to them and make sure they're still doing okay and that they have a plan in place for how they're going to access care. Um, again, kind of outside a little bit of the primary care setting, but it's, we were very concerned that some patients in that very particular early time were kind of discharging to nothing. And um, then, you know, all that work that we had done with them to really help them in their progress and success and recovery could be really eroded in a moment when all of a sudden there were no crucial social constructs available for them to access. And, um, you know, again, substance use disorder just really lives in isolation. So there was just a lot of fear there. So that's how we tried to pivot and start using the registry differently from how we built it. Um, and with, with new patients, um, we really have, that's been a little bit harder, frankly. It, it's been a little bit harder to figure out where, you know, where folks are and how we can outreach to them differently before it turns into, you know, a real crisis situation or a moment where someone's calling in for, you know, crisis services or, you know, coming into the emergency room. And so we continue to struggle with figuring out how to identify new patients, um, you know, trying very hard to triage people on those COVID screening questions at the front door um, and over the phone when people call to a point, but, you know, you're just, you're not going to get it all right. There's, there's always going to be, um, you know, room for improvement there. So we've, we've really had a hard time with the new patient aspect of it. The established patients have just been easier to identify because again, they're, they're sort of already in the system. We kind of know where they're at and what their pathway is. And then the new patient population in particular, the larger influx of Medicaid patients that um, you know we've seen and, and patients who have maybe particularly lost coverage in another way and coming onto Medicaid and coming into a new system. And I mean, it's like new, 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 new <laughs> for these folks all over. And, and that's been really challenging. Jen, how about you? Uh, well, we use uh, MHITS, which is the registry through UW Ames. Um, and so we've been using that uh, for a long time now. And basically we can use that to track and see how many days it's been since a client was last seen, which is really nice. You get a nice reminder screen right when you sign in. Um, we can also track um, their GAD and PHQs. It has a nice scale that you can see, you know, if it's going down, if it's going up, if it's kind of staying flat. 
Um, and then also, um, it also helps with our site consults because um, Dr. Turner can actually see um, our client lists in there. Um, he can see who's needing um, either an initial site consult or needs a follow-up, which is usually about three to six months out. Um, so that's really nice. That hasn't changed at all. Um, and then we also use NextGen, which is our EHR. And that's where we coordinate with our primary care providers. Um, they can send their referrals for behavioral health directly through NextGen. Um, and then myself and or Dr. Normoyle um, we'll, we'll review all the referrals and assign them accordingly and or if they're not appropriate for our program, uh, we refer them out. Uh, we have a really good relationship with another behavioral health agency down here in Lewis County that we're often referring back and forth between each other um, because they do provide kind of higher level of care. Um, and so Basically, that, those are the two things that we use in coordination with each other. Um, you know, we'll put our notes initially into MHITS and then we transfer them over to NextGen, but our referral process really hasn't changed much because they have to be connected with a primary care provider in order to get behavioral health services. So it's pretty much the same as pre-COVID, <laughs> so. Thank you. No, I've seen a several questions come in, which we will hopefully have some time for here at the end of our session. But my last question, I think for all of you, is just, you know, from a program perspective, as you think about access and quality, how have, you know, how have patient volumes, no-show rates, have they changed? And anything you're noticing around kind of quality metrics with your programs during this time? I don't know, Bonnie, you want to? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. We've, we've actually noticed generally speaking that our no-show um, rates have actually gone down. So folks are actually accessing more service than they were accessing before. You know, I don't have to drive to a place. I don't have to find parking. I, you know, I don't have that, all the hassle a of accessing services and B um, you know, I think too, it's, it's sort of worth thinking about, especially in behavioral health, you know, maybe people are accessing additional services because it feels a little safer um, accessing behavioral health care at home. Um, maybe there's a little bit less stigma associated with that. I, I just think those kinds of things are worth thinking about. You know, we haven't necessarily asked patients those questions point blank, but it's just been something that's been kind of on my mind around the effect of what might it look like even into the future um, the post pandemic when uh, we start providing services in person, how can we continue the hybrid so that people can maintain their engagement and care in whatever place they feel safest doing that? Um, so that's just been sort of think, I've just been thinking about that. Um, we also, and I didn't quite have a chance to connect this yet, but we also started a, a pilot project in April um, in direct response to the pandemic to engage uh, peer recovery coaches in our care. And so that's a kind of more broadly speaking, not, not necessarily only in primary care, but really all over the place um, to try to identify those patients I was sort of referring to earlier, which is those ones who maybe were struggling with the social isolation, were in treatment before, but now we weren't totally sure, you know, where, where they were at with their behavioral health care, trying to just engage with them in a different way um, with folks who have lived experience, who have success in recovery, who can really just walk alongside them and meet them where they're at. So we started a pilot project with um, four recovery peers back in April, which ends um, in the summer. And we're um, going to try to continue it. But for now, that's kind of what the timeline looks like. And we did a patient survey related to that pilot. And that's really, um, you know, of course, small n because it hasn't been going on for very long and um, kind of anecdotal feedback, but we're getting really positive feedback about patients really saying they really appreciated the, the connection to that person um, and really feeling like that was, a, that was a huge benefit to them, even if they didn't necessarily use sort of per se the peer in, in direct needing direct care or anything it's more just about like wow it was really great to hear from someone and especially to hear from someone who has that lived experience with success and recovery so that was pretty powerful for us we're getting a lot of positive survey results from from patients about that and we just really hope to continue that so that kind of speaks a little bit to the quality question um, around what we've been up to and um, we're just really happy to see that effect of, of the use of peers and I think in a large system like Kaiser to start using peers is just huge and, and could really pretend a lot of positive things in the future. Thank you. Jen? Um, well, much like Bonnie was saying, I mean, our, our show rates um, have gone up 
um, incrementally. And we've had definitely had more referrals coming in on um, a weekly basis. So I think at one point, one week I had 32 referrals come in and that's pretty big for our area and our program. So um, our show rates have also gone up uh, during this time, right at the start. Um, we decided to implement a texting reminder uh, system. So the medical team and dental have been doing it for a while and, and I don't know what the holdup was with us, but we finally implemented that and we definitely noticed that the no show rates went down due to the texting reminders. Um, and last week it went down for a few days and uh, we noticed that the no shows started going up a little bit. So it definitely was proving to us that it was a, a good system to have in place. Um, we've also had more uh, calls from clients, well, patients, potential patients that weren't already connected with Valley View and our medical team. So for a couple of months, we were um, taking those clients in because we definitely wanted to be there for the community, regardless of whether if they were connected with a primary care provider through Valley View. Um, we're now phasing that out a little bit. Um, but it was really nice to be able to provide those services in the community because we, I mean, down here, we were just getting inundated. Cascade was getting inundated. So, um, you know, we were wanting to be there to serve people in the community and be there for them. So, um, yeah, we've, and we've definitely had very positive feedback from our patients on medical side and on behavioral health side that we were still up and running and that they could still get their services and still, you know, see their providers and meet with them, whether it was through telehealth video or for through the phone. So um, it's been a pretty, it's been a very positive experience for our program. Great. Thank you both for, so much for sharing. Um, we have some really great questions coming in. So I think we're maybe, I, we have just some resources that we'll send out these slides after. I know Amy will send out follow-up information, but I think it would be great um, during our remaining time. I know I have more questions too to ask you, but I would love to get to some of the questions from the audience. Amy, do you want me to read these? Is that the best way to do this? I've not. Yeah, if you're, uh, if you're comfortable with that, that seems just keep it on going on your end. <laughs> All right. Um, so um, Bonnie, there's a question for you around what codes are billed when you don't need to use a psychiatry consult through MindPhone? Do you build differently depending on the providers involved in the care team? Yeah, that's a good question. And, you know, I, I can sort of only answer the last part of that, which is I do know that we build differently depending on which care provider kind of has a has a touch in, in the patient's case. I don't know exactly what the codes are, but certainly can can grab those for whoever asked that and, and provide that to you, Sarah, so you can add that to the notes. Um, yeah, we do use different different coding based on the different team members that are involved. And we actually, as a Kaiser system, a little bit unique, we're kind of a provider and a health plan at the same time and um, weren't in the past and and this is you know a, a while ago really using different codes to differentiate complexity of care or the people involved in the care at all um, and so we we've shifted to that over the past couple of years so the behavioral health consultants are using different codes and um, I know when the mind phone does does or doesn't get used that gets that gets coded appropriately so we are kind of adding in those codes to make sure that the patient case kind of reflects the work that we did um, and as an HMO I think in the past um, we, we didn't maybe attend to that quite as well as, as we should have so I do know that we do use those different codes but I'm not sure what specifically they are. Great. Um, all right there's a question from Laura Crooks can you talk about how you might be triaging in person for those at higher risk or those with serious mental illness do you do a combination of in-person visits and telehealth? Do you have a standard for post-discharge? Either of you, Bonnie or Jen? Um, well, we, uh, we don't do, uh, work with clients uh, that are chronic. Um, we, our program, we, we can't serve um, clients that are schizophrenic, um, borderline personality disorder and or bipolar one. So um, usually what we do is when I get the referral through my behavior, through my primary care provider, I review those referrals, um, look at their diagnosis, see if they have any past um, behavioral health care in the medical record um, and kind of assess if they're appropriate for our program. So it's still pretty much the same. If they ne they're needing a higher level of care, um, we will refer them out um, to Cascade Mental Health, who's, who's local with us, 
Um, in Thurston County, it would be BHR. Um, so we do refer out to other agencies um, for, that, for that need. Um, if they've been in kind of high crisis mode, if they're feeling suicidal or they're having high self-harming behaviors, um, that's where our warm connect really comes in handy because I can talk directly or our other providers can talk directly to the patient um, and, and assess what their need is, assess what the risk is, see if they can keep themselves safe or not, if they're surrounded by other people, create a, you know, a safety plan with them, um, and then get them set up with the, the services that they're actually needing. Yeah, uh, for me, not much to add. I mean, I, th I think Jen described it really, really well as far as like kind of how we're managing it. We are doing a combination of in-person and virtual care that I think that that comment asked that as well. Um, and I don't think we address that in, in the panel discussion. We we do screen patients for if they need kind of in-person, more intensive um, face-to-face care and we'll certainly provide it you know centers and, and clinics aren't closed per se um, and so we will do that and we'll have those those triage questions and and again I think someone also asked about risk stratification kind of same idea so when I'm on the phone and I'm appointing or when I'm even with my primary care provider um, what kinds of questions can we ask the patient to sort of get them to where they need to go and sometimes that is a serious mental illness issue or maybe a crisis issue and we we'd be prepared um, to respond to that with an in-person and intervention. Um, so yes, and then kind of Jen described a lot of the other resources in the community we're using very similarly um, in our areas as well. There was a question around obtaining consent. I'm assuming during this time, I'm assuming it means when you're doing like a telehealth visit, how you're obtaining consent. It's my understanding consent can be verbal. However, consent has to be obtained by or under the direct supervision of the PCP. Yeah, so I guess uh, for us, it's, you know, primary care provider will always ask the patient if, if they want to engage with our, our behavioral health consultant. Um, it's not required, you know, it's not mandatory, even even if the PCP um, really, really wants that patient to do that. Of course, we ask, is that okay? Um, and so that's how we're obtaining that kind of consent. And then, of course, patients also can sort of self self-identify as needing that as needing that care and then we'll we'll talk with the BHC about you know what that looks like so for us it's it is verbal consent right now and, it, and generally it's driven by the primary care provider who identifies the patient yeah I mean pretty much what Bonnie's saying it's pretty similar um, they get consent from the primary from the patient the primary care provider does in order to even process the referral um, and then when I'm doing the intake, I do ask for their verbal consent and we've asked all of our behavioral health providers to get that verbal consent. And then in our notes, we make sure at the top that we do say, you know, patient gave verbal consent for treatment. Um, they will be able to sign the official papers when we're back kind of into the post COVID era, whenever that will be. But um, so we just make sure to really note, note it and make, and make sure it's in our, in our billing notes as well. Great. And I'll just add, I know HCA has done a great job. I have a, a, um, one of the links is to their um, telemedicine, telehealth briefs, and it talks about consent and consent during this time. Medicare also has published information around consent during this time so for folks to refer to. Um, someone was asking, Bonnie, about this uh, couple questions about COVID for the caring calls. We were talking about those Care Connect calls, I believe mm -hmm. you called them. Do you, is that something you could share with us, those questions that um, your yeah. team is asking. Yeah, I'd be happy to share those. I saw that question come through and, and yeah, would be happy to send that along so you guys can have all those really in writing and, um, and use them and, and think about how you might incorporate that as well. Absolutely, I'll do that. Okay, we'll do that as a follow-up item for everyone. Great. Thank you. Um, how about thoughts about how to engage people whose alcohol and drug use has, not, has gone up, but they are not showing signs of dependency? Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's an afternoon panel in and of itself I think yeah. probably um yeah you know I, I don't I guess I would just more sort of speak uh, to say yes that is definitely an issue and we're we're really thinking about how that works too I mean I think if if you're kind of attuned to this population what's happening now is um 
the alcohol dependency amongst uh, upper middle class white women is really on the rise. Um, the wine industry has done a great job of uh, marketing to to folks, and so um, that's the more of the person with alcohol use disorder that that's that's coming into view right now and is very new um, in the landscape. I think when people think about alcohol use disorder, they don't necessarily think about that population. So it'll be interesting to see how we can respond. Um, and a lot of that really just falls into the category of that like gray area drinking, I guess you'd call it. Um, that is really kind of hard to talk about, um, hard to diagnose, maybe there isn't even a diagnosis. So really, uh, that's just sort of me saying we struggle with that too. And we're really just talking about it and thinking about it as well and about how we might screen those patients differently when they start to come back into in person services and also how we might think about treatment differently in maybe a little bit more of a harm reduction mode for those folks. So instead of abstinence only, abstinence kind of rules at all, it's more about what kind of reductions um, might we set goals for or um, or that, you know, that kind of conversation we can have with patients that's maybe a little more patient-centered, a little more goal-oriented, and not necessarily kind of all or nothing thinking about alcohol use. Yeah, we um, we do drug and alcohol screenings at initial intake, and then probably I would say every couple of months we'll do, we'll do an updated one just to see. Um, during the, the COVID, um, definitely been having some more open conversations with my clients that I know we're using a little bit before um, the lockdown hit and um, just really asking them if their level of marijuana use has gone up because that seems to be a very popular substance um, during this time um, and um, any kind of like alcohol use that has gone up. And then really just really trying to meet the client where they're at. You know, are they feeling like it's become very, you know, disruptive to their, to their life and what's going on? Or is it more of that, you know, don't do the all or nothing thing, but just try to do a little bit of, of reduction and, and putting in place other coping skills, um, kind of thinking outside the box on activities, um, hobbies they can do, anything that they can kind of replace the, oh, it's six o'clock, it's time for my glass of wine type of thing. Um, so just really trying to meet them where they're at with this, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, Bonnie, if Final question here, it looks like around the peer program you were talking about and how do they begin engagement with the patient? Is that with a phone call or how does that happen? Yeah, it's typically phone call or text. That seems to be the, the prevailing way to connect with folks now. And, you know, peers have always really used the phone and text as, as a real crucial part of their work. And so they kind of came to this very naturally and were like, oh, yeah, we, we know how to do this. We can manage, um, you know, texting with patients and, and phone calls. So that is how they've identified them. We'll have our KP staff sort of identify the patients they want outreach for, and then peers will outreach to them over the phone. Yeah. They are doing some in-person services, just also as a PS. Um, you know, if a patient needs a ride uh, to a place, if a patient needs to engage in maybe a, you know, a higher level of like withdrawal management, um, medically monitored, something like that, they can take them there. So the peer is, um, can be out and about, but really only as necessary and, and would really do more of their work virtually like everybody else. Great. Uh, I guess we have time. We have uh, two more minutes. So maybe one more question about focusing it all on specific populations. Um, for example, those being treated for cancer. So I guess your programs, I, I don't know which program, you, you have lots of different programs you both have talked about, but just maybe in general, the population that you're working with. Um, we tend to have a lot of clients with chronic pain. Um, and so, and I've been noticing kind of an uptick in that during, um, during COVID. Uh, and so I've been doing a lot of kind of mindfulness meditation practices with my clients that are dealing with chronic pain. Um, so, I mean, that's kind of one that, that I've been more focused on. I know my other BH providers might work with um, older populations that are more prone to um, dealing with cancer and maybe some other chronic diseases. Uh, so I can't speak for them really, but I do know for my um, particular clients that I tend to get in, there's a lot of chronic pain happening um, and how to deal with that, especially when they can't get out and about um, just to kind of move their bodies in a, in a nice gentle way. So um, really working on a lot of mindfulness during this time. 
Yeah, and we, we don't necessarily have a specific um, population that we're, we're targeting with our um, sort of collaborative care models with our behavioral health consultants. So kind of short answer, no, um, but certainly um, it's, a, it's an interesting idea and, and definitely an, an interesting thing to think about. I just wanted to thank again, Bonnie and Jen for joining us today. Gosh, I'd want to be a patient in each of your health systems. I think you guys have been so innovative over this period of time. Um, and I really appreciate it. I learned a lot um, from both of you today. Um, and we'll follow up, um, Amy, with you, I think, with some of the resources that we have talked about. I'll get them from Bonnie, Jen, and I'll send out the slides as well um, later this week. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah and Diane, for, for partnering with us in the, in the summit today and bringing Bonnie and Jen on board. Um, we really appreciate your expertise and, and the workflows that you've shared. So we're going to move into a break right now. Um, I wish it was more than five minutes, but that is what we have at the moment. Um, and then we will return at 2.20 to hear from the Healthcare Authority. And I just really want to... Um, Sort of put the call out to all of you listening as you're on break you know think about the presentations that you just heard and reflect on um, the importance of physician suicide you know we're all doing such important work but it is important to take that um, self-reflection on yourselves and your coworkers and your staff and think about what um, Dr. Bree's children spoke about earlier on in the program so just something to think about and then we'll go on break and return in about five minutes. Thank you all.
Hi, everybody. Hi, Judy. Hi, Sue. We will start again in just a moment. And I want to really welcome our colleagues from the Healthcare Authority to this discussion. And the HCA is really a leader in moving our state healthcare system to truly address what makes and what keeps us healthy. Uh, by emphasizing the importance of behavioral health and helping our providers across the state move to offering services more virtually through this pandemic. So it is my pleasure to introduce Sue Birch, Director of the Washington State Healthcare Authority and Dr. Judy Zerzan, Chief Medical Officer of the Healthcare Authority. So Judy, Sue, I will turn it over to you. Excellent. Thanks, Ginny. And uh, Sue and I are tag teaming this a little bit. So I will start with a little bit of an overview of how the Healthcare Authority uses Bree and some of the work that we've done. And then I will tag team to Sue, who will talk a little bit more about behavioral health integration and some of that work and a little um, how COVID has affected all of this. So are you good, Sue? I think I'm driving the slides. So I think as most of you know, HCA is the state's largest healthcare purchaser and we purchase healthcare for more than 2 million Washington residents uh, through Medicaid. And also uh, you'll hear me say ERB, E-R-B, which is our employee and retiree benefits that include public employees, school employees and retirees. And we have really, particularly in the last few years, um, really taken this, how do we improve healthcare bull by the horns. And so we are working in these three areas is sort of at the heart of our work, transforming care, uh, working on whole person care, uh, which is why you all are here today, and using data informed evidence to make purchasing decisions. And we've made a commitment that I think many of you know about to really move from the old way of fee for service and paying for volume to uh, getting to paying for value and a high percentage of our healthcare spend being somehow tied into value-based purchasing. And this is a bit where the physical and behavioral health integration journey began. So before integration, we've had a couple of layers of integration here at HCA. The first one was integration of um, the behavioral health services from DSHS, the Department of Social and Human Services. Um, and that was done um, over the course of the last couple of years, but planning happened before that. And before integration, the, the key here, which is similar on our integrated behavioral health that we're doing at the managed care organization level, there wasn't any one payer or provider accountable for the whole thing. So um, what was covered under DSHS included the regional mental health carve outs for people with serious and persistent mental illness, um, the county administered uh, substance use disorder treatment programs, um, including uh, state agency residential programs. Um, and then HCA was responsible for outpatient mental health that was not for people with serious and persistent mental illnesses and medications. And so it really made sense to, to move together and get into this whole person care management with a single accountable entity and bring together um, those services um, to have similar policies and to leverage our managed care services to really get better care for, um, for our population. So where the Brie comes in, um, the Brie was started in 2011 in an environment of um, a broken healthcare system. So mixed quality, mixed outcomes, high cost, little equity. Um, and the Brie was created to bring some order to this in a multi-stakeholder process and really promote evidence-based practices. And so I think you all know about this, but um, the part that is particularly important for the healthcare authority is how do we figure out um, how to better manage these services that have high variation 
in utilization and high variation in outcomes and, and how can we do better? So when the BRI makes its recommendations, and this is the little nifty model, um, for us, BRI is in statute. And it is in a couple of different ways. There's a report required to our director, Sue. I don't know, on my screen, she's below me. Um, and HCA gets each of the BRI reports. We review them. Um, we look at their decisions and then we figure out what parts can we adopt, how can we pull them into our contracts, and how can they help us with our state purchased healthcare programs. And then annually we have a report to the legislature and the governor's office about that work, which uh, are all public and online if you want to know the nitty gritty. But really I think the, the piece where it is actionable for us is that we have embedded um, many of these BRI recommendations and many of the directions um, in our uh, managed care contracts for Medicaid and in our employee and retiree contracts, um, including things like benefit management, um, what's covered, what's not covered, and how, um, training um, in particular in our managed care organization contracts. There's some language about behavioral health integration and how important that is and how training needs to be included in that. And so this is a laundry list of BRI topic recommendations, which I think many of you are familiar with, but I wanted to sort of um, pull out a couple to make comments on where I think the BRI work has been really impactful for the healthcare authority. So first, um, bundled payment models, I think our total knee and our total hip replacement bundles on our public employee and now school employee side have been quite dramatic. Um, the complication rate has gone way down. We, we measure sort of a variety of complication rates and the patient satisfaction has gone way up um, because we really sort of encompass that whole person idea of care. Um, and we help the, the person who's getting surgery have their family member involved. Um, and it has been really quite a successful program. Um, we've worked on other bundles. I think most recently we are still working with you on the maternity bundle payment model. And how do we think about how do we get the best whole person care for a pregnant person and their baby? And how can we really start off the life course um, in the, on the right foot? Uh, there are a number of BRI reports on opioid prescribing and opioid metrics. Uh, we have adopted all of those across all of our lines of business. And I think that has really helped us uh, tackle the opioid addiction epidemic um, in a much better and thoughtful way than without the BRI. Um, we've seen our opioid prescribing rates come down a fair bit um, and a lot of changes in prescribing that I think is all quite positive. And then finally, um, what we're here for today, this um, integrating behavioral health into primary care, um, we've taken that to heart, particularly in our Medicaid managed care organizations. And, um, and I think that report um, is quite well done. In terms of how we look at each of these recommendations and how we keep track of things, we are actually in the middle of um, of making a, a spreadsheet in an internal framework now. This is not real, but an idea of what it looks like. Um, so has topics and um, has columns for our employee and retiree benefits and columns for our Medicaid managed care organizations and fee for service and have broken out uh, many of these reports into parts to think about, have we implemented them all the way? If we haven't, why not? Are there places that we want to sort of bolster or strengthen up? Or are there places that we want to feed back to the BRI of this could really be helpful if we augment this in some way? Uh, and so I look forward to that future work and, um, and I'm excited about all of the great work the BRI, uh, the BRI does. And with that, I'll keep advancing the slides, Sue, and pass it over to you to talk a little bit about how um, we've integrated um, behavioral health and physical health in our Medicaid managed care organizations. And I think you're on mute still. There you go. Gosh, I'm never on mute, so I had to correct myself. Yeah. 
<laughs> oh, our new uh, Zooming abilities. Um, good day, everybody, and thank you, Dr. Serzan, for that um, foundation that you laid. And I think um, Washington and really needs to pride itself on this journey that we've been on together. And it was absolutely fabulous hearing um, from Dr. Bree's family because we, too, here at Healthcare Authority, really understand the need to keep transforming and evolving. So I'd like to spend just a few minutes covering some of the principles of the um, Medicaid managed care work that's going on here in Washington. Judy already laid the framework of um, nearly 1.9 million Washingtonians enrolled in Apple Health and about 87% are enrolled in managed care. And we have five um, of the MCO, managed care organization plans, and they are contracted with the, our state to deliver this integrated care. I will remind you that it's Molina Healthcare of Washington, Community Health Plan of Washington, United Healthcare, Coordinated Care, and AmeriGroup. And um, I do think it's important to call out that coordinated care manages care for children involved in the foster care system statewide. We are in an active procurement um, about um, our partnership with these MCOs, so I won't be entertaining any questions, but we will have some announcements um, in the near future about what's changing with um, their contracts. And I think it's really important, as Judy showed you, and Judy can advance the slide, um, I think it's important to know that um, integrated managed care is now statewide. Those last three regions um, were implemented this January. And so most of the Medicaid clients have, um, they're enrolled in Medicaid-only clients uh, receiving full medical and behavioral health benefits through managed care. Our dual eligible, eligible clients receive behavioral health benefits through managed care. And our American Indian Alaska Natives can opt out. And the um, behavioral health ASOs in each region um, manage the crisis system, the SAMHSA grants, and some local programs. And you might be going, yeah, grants? Well, grants in our state really um, sum up over a billion dollars worth of SAMHSA grants. So it's a really significant um, partner that we have in our federal um, partners. And then most of the behavioral health administrative service organizations converted from the BHOs that had been in place um, and Beacon Health operates in regions where county-based systems did not want that option, and that's Southwest, North Central, and Pierce. Um, I want to just comment a little bit more because there's always confusion about uh, roles and responsibilities. Um, and you'll see there the list of what happens um, with our managed care organizations. So if, for example, you are experiencing where there isn't much care management going on or there isn't um, a, there are network issues. We need to know about that here at the Healthcare Authority so we can really uphold uh, the contract requirements that the MCOs have with us. Um, but by and large, um, on the provider network, we contract with providers, uh, or they contract with providers to ensure the availability of sufficient number and type of providers within a required distance um, to meet the diverse needs of our, our members. And they also are um, very, uh, critical in engaging providers, um, and they, they, most of our MP, MCOs offer a continuum of payment approaches, including value-based models uh, for provider partners to provide opportunities for share savings and to be rewarded uh, with incentives for high quality care. And then networks are routinely monitored um, to ensure the access and availability standards that are maintained, that need to be maintained. They also play a huge role in community engagement. So just like we in healthcare um, under Obamacare wanted to even out access, we wanted to even out service delivery, and we're working on strengthening primary care, we're now kind of moving more deeper into the social determinant space and community engagement space. And the MCO partners with community-based organizations and agencies at the local level help increase um, kind of health literacy, they increase the understanding of healthcare coverage, drive health education campaigns, um, and build better connections across the service delivery continuum. Um, they do this in partnership with our accountable communities of health, but the MCOs hire locally and regionally base their staff and um, uh, share their resources. 
They are also really critically important in supporting those ACHs uh, because that's really central to what we here in Washington are trying to do to create more uniformity and evidence-based social programs. And this is gonna be a year's worth of work and investments that we've got to keep pushing for to even out services so that things like food um, insecurity programs are uh, more even across the state. Um, that's just one example. Transportation, housing, there's just all those social determinant pieces that um, we need to, as a society, um, keep pushing for more evidence base to them and then for more uniformity and investments. Um, so the, a the FCOs also partner with our ACHs to launch transformation projects and support unique local initiatives. So it is great because all health ultimately is local and very personal, but they work kind of regionally to make sure that the unique needs of a region and at that locale are met. And so you'll see them quite oftentimes, the MCOs hosting huge summits in partnerships with the ACHs and um, tailoring them to that particular region. The MCOs have also offered grants to communities to support local projects that um, improve health outcomes. So Malia's done some great uh, work. AmeriGroup has done stuff with Triple Play, Boys and Girls Club of America, and their foundation. And um, I'm sorry, I, I uh, cruised over Molina, but Molina's um, invested in projects designed to meet um, increasing access, addressing community-based needs. Uh, they've done a lot with measuring health outcomes, uh, reducing avoidable healthcare costs, and complementing the ACHs and the interlocal leadership um, and doing a lot too in the school settings. So these are um, some examples of value added benefits where youth programs, uh, boys and girls club memberships, you know, quit for life programs, those, you know, virtual urgent care, um, cell phone distribution, acupuncture, um, even standing up wide by hotspots. These are the things that the MCOs and the ACHs can bring forward and help communities get, um, get the social side of the services in the right mix to our great medical and physical health care. So a little bit more about care management. Um, in support of clinical integration, the MCOs also support team-based care and consultation on complex cases. And they've got deeper relationships with providers and they're often able to enter into different um, BBP or care management relationships. So for example, in the rural hospitals, like some at Pacific, they've really done some um, exemplary work. And I really wanna point out that um, during the COVID crisis, when we were really, uh, we were just uh, careening towards a surge at the hospital, we really worked in coordination with our partners at Department of Social and Health Services, with the managed care organization discharge teams and our own complex um, discharge management caseworkers here to really move folks out of hospitals so we would have uh, more beds available as we went into that COVID crisis. So there is all sorts of um, unique care management that goes on individually at each of the MCOs, but then in partnership with state agencies. And again, these are really, really complex cases. So here are some common elements in HCA's new models of care that I think are worth talking about. Because um, this is really important for us to kind of always go back a little and think about what are we trying to do? What are our, gui our guiding principles? And um, it, these, because it, we get lost in a lot of COVID details and other details that um, you can imagine are surprising all of us. But um, unsurprisingly, data is at the center of this model. And we are really trying to accelerate now too to build up um, greater integrated data systems that um, we need financial risk sharing at the provider level, quality measures from the Washington Statewide Common Measure Set that look at acute care and preventative care like screenings and chronic care, like people with diabetes having their blood sugar in control range. So HCA rewards providers for attaining and improving on quality of care. And we wanna leverage the local expertise and implement care transformation strategies based on three recommendations. So there are all sorts of pros about um, the 
kind of MCO um, financing, the rate setting process and gain sharing. And I think it's worth mentioning that um, this really comes with very robust uh, actuarial rate setting and related protections. Um, fee for service doesn't have those kind of requirements and protections. And we have an executive legislative forecast group um, and this is really important for people to understand because it helps um, as we meld in all these factors, uh, the MCOs have financial incentives to manage utilization. They have risk of over or underfunding um, treatment costs and capitation rates. Um, that's mitigated within a corridor such that neither the MCOs nor state have significant gains or losses related to forecasting errors. With behavioral health integration, which is now statewide, uh, this factor is even more critical. There's minimal additional state resources required when MCOs experience losses. As you can see in the previous per capita um, funding chart earlier, things change. And states can determine parameters to shift more or less risk, which we have employed fairly regularly and often um, with some concerns from the MCOs. The, other thing I want to talk about is an area that Washington has really prided itself in, whole person care. And um, this work comes from, as many of you know, a national movement. Um, we work closely with the Center for Healthcare Strategies. But we all knew um, when we took on health reforms back in, um, feels like decades ago, but for health reform that we really had to address accountability for cost and outcomes, and this imperative is driving um, a system designed to focus on social, physical, and behavioral health needs, and it really emphasizes coordination of the care across the sectors. Um, we require financial flexibility, shared data, collaborative leadership, but the whole person care movement or the person-centered care movement needs to keep maturing here in our state, and we'll get there as we keep delivering on true integration. So again, here's our fundamental pillars. Um, we really want to support people with practice transformation. I do want to note, because I was listening into the behavioral health presentation, um, HCA stood up 2,000 Zoom licenses for behavioral health and primary care providers to be used during COVID. And it really has begun to help transform some of the practices to think about, you know what, we used to require face-to-face -face visits can now can be um, delivered in different ways. And we are really wanting to keep building on that whole person approach. So I loved all the practical strategies that were mentioned earlier in the presentation. Um, we clearly have to keep getting more rigorous about financial oversight and new models of purchasing. I say all the time, it's a little dizzying to some, but I say we got to think about hybrid payments. I think we are learning a lot, certainly in the COVID times, that maybe some of the sheer uh, traditional capitation um, uh, methodology doesn't play so well in these um, very uh, fast changing times, but I think our commitment to value based payment remains high and we think that um, we will be able to tweak and keep uh, delivering with some hybrid payments. And then the Medicaid transformation. Um, I do think it's really important to call that out that the MCOs really have partnered with the community to address some of the most challenging um, patients. And they've really shifted from traditional medical model to this whole person care. And I think we'll keep seeing them and all of us shift as we move deeper into the social determinants of health space. So a few other things to mention. Um, the Department of Health statewide behavioral health forecast with COVID was um, stood up to really provide a brief initial forecast of the behavioral health impacts and it captures the key concepts and models. I think you'd have to really um, be staying home and in your closet and not listening to any media to know that um, anxiety, depression, all the change um, that we're experiencing has really created a lot of stressors. So in partnership um, with the other state agencies, um, there was a team created, a behavioral health strike team based on literature review, and it was informed by data. 
And um, they're doing some great uh, work about trying to get upstream of some of the impacts that we are seeing and will likely continue to see as we go through COVID-19. So um, key things that are changed um, that or have been added with COVID-19 is, um, again, we know that there's going to be so many more Washingtonians that are going to continue to experience the acute stress, anxiety, and depression. Um, and certainly as we get later in the year and if we have more surges or more impact, we know that we have to brace for more of these impacts and we need everybody really on heightened alert about um, behavioral health screening and service delivery. Um, I think, uh, again, the unemployment issues. Um, so everybody knows that we've just had a significant increase in the unemployment and we've also um, begun to see some uptick in suicide rates. Um, information about crimes and domestic violence. Um, we're monitoring a number of these things, but I think it's, again, very critical that um, folks know that we've got dashboards and frameworks and different tools that we're trying to monitor as we keep getting um, through COVID-19 and certainly some of our equity challenges and issues. So we need your good work now more than ever, and really at every stage of life, cradle to grave, we really need our primary care partners and our behavioral health partners to really be over delivering. And I, I really want to encourage you all, um, the, the uh, healthcare authority opened up evening and weekend differentials for all of our telehealth. And it's been a little disappointing that we are not seeing more uptake on services going beyond eight to five or services on Saturday and Sunday. And I think we as a society need to keep building up this notion of we don't need just great, acute, um, urgent hospital care. We've got to have really robust um, systems of care in the non-hospital settings. So we've got our challenges ahead of us, but we'll uh, keep working on it and we will build up that capacity um, on those off hours and uh, off work day, off traditional work days. So I think I'm going to stop there and turn it back to Ginny or Amy. Hi, yes, thank you so much, Sue and Judy, for sharing all of that and, and giving us insight into your thoughts and processes and what you'll be working on moving forward. We really appreciate your time with us today. Um, I am now going to move us over. Um, I don't, no questions came through the Q&A uh, box, so I'm just going to move us into our next section, which is um, Cody Russell from Kitsap Strong. I'm going to assume that Cody is, I saw that he's online, um, and it looks like there he is. Hello. Um, so I'm going to just give a little bit of brief background. Cody Russell is the executive director of Kitsap Strong, and he's one of 25 Washington State certified trainers in the near sciences. That's neuroscience, epigenetics, adverse childhood experience, or ACEs, and resiliency curriculum that challenges our understanding of human behavior and many of the social and health challenges that we see in our community. Cody has over 10 years of experience working with children and families in the child welfare system who have experienced significant trauma and struggled with associated social and health problems, including mental health issues, substance use disorders, aggression, child abuse and neglect, anger, hostility, sexual behavior issues, homelessness, poverty, et cetera. Cody received his bachelor's in psychology from Seattle University in 2000 and a master's in social work from Eastern Washington University in 2014. He uses his education and lived experience working with children and families through the child welfare system to add deep meaning and life to the science of trauma and resiliency. As you will see over the next period of time, even in our new virtual world, Cody is an engaging and entertaining presenter who uses storytelling and real life examples to help make sense of complex scientific information. I personally am truly sad that we are not in person because usually he would have given us all colored pencils and some doodling materials and I, which I've always appreciated having those when I have seen him present in person. Um, but hopefully next time we can do that when we're all together again. So now I will turn it over to Cody. I'm gonna unmute you. Let's see, unmute audio. Uh, I think you're Cody, you're, there you are, Cody. Go Hi. Ahead. <clears throat> awesome, thank you. Are you able to hear me? 
Yes, we are. Thanks. Beautiful. Thank you, everyone. It's an honor and privilege to be here today. Um, <clears throat> I appreciate uh, coming in on the heels of a, a fabulous conversation around behavioral health and, and navigating this pandemic and, and all of the associated um, challenges that it brings to our community. Uh, so thank you again. It's an honor and privilege to be here joining in and, and leaning into this conversation. Uh, we talk about helping old people flourish and we're really going to share with you a bundle of science information. Uh, you'll notice me audibly breathing. One of the things I've found as I've been more engaged in doing more of this virtual training is that um, because we're not in the same shared physical space, I find it's more difficult for me to regulate my, my emotions, uh, the things that I feel as a presenter, the um, adrenaline that I get, because I don't have the luxury of having your physical presence near me, being able to respond to all of your nonverbal cues, being able to feel the rhythm of you breathing next to me, and all of those things that help us regulate through a process of what we call co-regulation. So I'm having to do more of that on my own. And as we lean into this conversation, I acknowledge that if you're in a space by yourself, you're also going to have to do more of that on your own. You don't have the benefits of being next to somebody else unless maybe you've got a, a fur baby there with you that's cuddled up that's helping you regulate or a little one under your desk and, and, and also helping you regulate. So I highly encourage you to do what you need to do to take care of you throughout this conversation. We won't necessarily have a formal break, but I invite you, as Amy said, I use color pencils and coloring and crayon. Um, that's one way that helps me stay engaged, but also enables me to be able to regulate my, my stress level so I can participate in the conversation. So uh, with that being said, I also want to just um, take a space here and an opportunity to invite you in. I know that we're joining virtually, so I don't know where you're physically located, but I want to invite you into my space where I'm currently at and acknowledge that I'm standing on the ancestral lines of the Coast Salish people, the Suquamish, Duwamish, the Port Gamble Sklalem tribe, who since time immemorial have used this physical location for a space to gather to nurture hearts, minds, bodies, and souls, to come together, to connect as humans, and to learn from one another. And it's with that spirit that I hope that we can engage in this conversation, to lean in together, to learn together, uh, and to explore this information. So I'm gonna um, take you through just a, a quick acknowledgement as to how we have, uh, how we came up with the name Kitsap Strong. So I represent, uh, a collective impact initiative, which is one way of saying, I represent 115 different organizations that have come together to work collectively on preventing adverse childhood experiences or preventing childhood trauma and building resiliency and building equity in our community. And, and the reason we call ourselves Kitsap Strong is we looked at and tried to listen and learn from the community around us. And what we acknowledged was that communities know how to respond to crises, whether it's a man-made or a natural disaster. Resiliency is a community experience. And I think we're seeing this play out right now during this pandemic. And as we navigate the, um, the social unrest due to the legacy of historical trauma, slavery and colonization, we are navigating right now and we're experiencing that resiliency is a community characteristic. It's about how we show up in times of crisis and celebration, and that's why we call ourselves Kitsap Strong, because we acknowledge that resiliency is not an individual thing, but a collective experience. It's about doing favors for one another, mutual aid. Um, anytime we see these natural disasters, you will see at the same time incredible stories of, quote, normal humans showing up, providing what they have, contributing any gifts that they have, um, showing up with bottles of water, their boat to rescue people from high flood waters. Um, there's an amazing story about a woman in New York who did the same thing following the 9-11 terrorist attack. She's doing the exact same thing, bringing PPE and other equipment to medical providers in New York throughout this pandemic, contributing our core gifts, 
and then also creating the space and the opportunity to welcome and receive the gifts of others. Because a high functioning, resilient community not only is a space where you feel like you can contribute, but that the community tells you that you're valuable and what you have to offer is exactly what that community needs to flourish. And that that experience kind of fills us all. And then the last thing is that it's also about connecting people with the resources that they need when they need them. So we, we, we took on this name Kitsap Strong because we are addressing a pandemic, the pandemic of uh, child abuse and neglect, the pandemic of adverse childhood experiences um, that is unseen but ravaging our community, leading to many of the uh, lifelong health and social challenges that uh, the healthcare system is responding to. So um, just an acknowledgement of the type of space that I'm hoping we can create here together in this virtual uh, setting. And I do see that the Q&A is not working, but hopefully the chat feature is working. And Amy, can you confirm that people are able to use the chat to participate? Yes, I will be monitoring the, the chat box. I apologize, I'm not sure what happened to the Q&A all of a sudden, <laughs> but we'll keep an eye on the chat box for incoming questions. Thank you. And I do want this to be a, a place in the space where we can connect and, and engage together. I know it's a little bit different virtually, uh, but I still am hopeful that we can uh, facilitate this as a dialogue. So we're going to be covering a lot of science information pretty rapidly. I encourage you to um, lean into this space, um, contribute what you have, um, know that we're going to be covering a lot of stuff. So take what's helpful and leave the rest. I also I want to center the wisdom of our community, acknowledge that a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today, you may already have heard, already know, already believe to be true. So it's really about uh, maybe packaging this information in a new and different way that hopefully helps you uh, moving forward and understanding the challenges that you face in the community and how we can address them. So this is really about uh, trying to promote a trauma-informed uh, approach to uh, uh, <clears throat> to our community. So some basic agreements here, again, setting the context for how I hope we'll participate and engage. Um, a sense of humor, not to make fun of childhood trauma, but as a tool to uh, have difficult conversations. Uh, respect, openness, this sense of a learning environment. I want us to lean in as learners, and uh, because um, when we engage in a space from the context of being a learner, we engage differently. When we engage as a student, when we uh, recognize that we are both students and teachers that, uh, and create the space at, that where you feel safe to share and speak your own truth, uh, and then you are able to hopefully listen to the truth of others as well. So <clears throat> I know that there'll be limitations as we navigate this virtual setting, but I'm hopeful that we'll be able to navigate those and learn together. So we'll be doing a, a kind of, um, Something that's really important for you to know is when you're working with people under high levels of stress, just knowing what to expect is really important. We call it anticipatory guidance. So we're gonna do an overview of this bundle of science we call the near sciences. Neuroscience, epigenetics, adverse childhood experiences and resiliency. We're gonna set a little context expectation so you know what to listen to. I want you to be the best students possible so I want you to know kind of how I hope to take the conversation and the way that we're, the types of uh, discussions that we hope to have. We're gonna do a deep dive into each one of those different four bundles of science information. We're gonna touch on regulation and de-escalation and what that means, the science behind that concept. And then uh, we're gonna package it all, bookend it all with helping you understand how all of this is about uh, changing our perspective about the behaviors and challenges that we may be facing and, and adopting a trauma-informed mindset. And, and I, I want to acknowledge that changing our perspective is a powerful form of intervention. So just changing the way that you think about the challenges that you're facing is a powerful action that we can take. So um, I shared this out, uh, Amy shared this out previously. Uh, many, uh, I saw that there had already been many people who'd responded to this. I'd still invite you to participate in that um, link that we shared out, <clears throat> asking you to reflect upon these two questions. What is, um, 
Thank you, Amy, for sharing it out. Uh, so one is, I thrived as a child because, or I would have thrived better if. So when I use the word thriving, what I mean by that is being able to um, reach your full potential and contribute to our community in a meaningful way. So by my definition, you are all thriving participants by the nature of what brings you into this conversation today, but I don't want to put a label on you. You may not feel like you're thriving today. You may not feel like you thrived as a child, and that's okay. I want to create uh, the opportunity that, um, that we're leaning into and thinking about what are the experiences, opportunities, and relationships that help all of us thrive and flourish. And then the other thing that I wanted us to lean into was thinking about when we're thinking about thriving, when we're thinking about uh, people being able to reach their full potential and contribute to our community in a meaningful way, what are your biggest concerns for children and adults in our community today? So I'll give us just a minute here, and then I'm going to change what I'm screen sharing to walk you through an activity, um, taking some of the data that you already shared with me uh, and putting it in front of us in a new, uh, a new context, hopefully. Hmm. Hmm. Hey, Amy, do you know if we have the whiteboard option or no? That I do not know. Um, Ginny or Alex, our tech guru, if you have any suggestions, I can real time try to explore my Zoom. I'm not seeing that it's allowing me to do it. Okay. I only see polls. I don't see a whiteboard option. I'm uh, apologize. Is there anything else I can do to support you to help? That's okay. I can either. Um, I, I've got some slides built in. We'll we'll navigate it. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. So hopefully some of you have had an opportunity to fill that um, thing out, and I'll look real fast. <clears throat> Looks like some more people are filling it out, so I appreciate that. So I'm going to go ahead and share what we have, and thankfully, um, I'm not dependent upon the whiteboard feature because I already put some of your input um, into the, the PowerPoint. So for those who already filled it out, thank you so much. Um, what, what I wanted to, to draw for you here, but you'll be able to look at this slide and, and get the imagery is this concept around what we call the near sciences Peter totter So um, what, what I want you to think about is on one side, we have the protective factors or the experiences that help us flourish. On one side, we have those experiences that, it, uh, that impact us at a fundamental level that can become overwhelming to our brains and bodies. So for example, these are some of the data points that you shared so when we're thinking about thriving, things that you said help all people flourish or help children flourish is this sense of independence with support. Having your basic needs met, having a sense of safety, having a loving family, um, so a family that shows you love, keeps you safe, provides for your basic needs. Having this sense that people are on your side, people are in your corner, right? Uh, feeling like you are a valuable contributor, a sense of belonging and connection encouragement, connection with nature, connection with community, loving parents, neighbors, coaches, mentors, um, education and other opportunities to find something that you're exceptional at, have access to those experiences and learn what you do and how you do it and learn how to do it well. And then uh, also having boundaries, rules and consistency uh, is that we actually need rules and boundaries to flourish. That helps us flourish, is understanding the, the, um, the cause and effect, so to speak, of relationships. Understanding that there are boundaries, that there are rules. So when we start to think about trauma-informed care, one of the criticisms that I often hear is that, it's, that there's no accountability for individuals, and that's, that's fundamentally wrong. Um, trauma-informed care isn't that we don't hold people accountable, but it's the way in which we do that. There's still boundaries, there's still rules, there's still structure, but it's the way in which we enforce that structure and it's the um, mindset behind the creation of that structure that's different. 
So um, these things, as you identified here, um, are the things that we acknowledge all humans need if they're going to thrive. Okay, so I'm going to see if I can share just my screen because I need to make some changes to the slide. Let's do that. So uh, thank you for your patience here. I'm having to navigate things a little bit differently because the whiteboard feature isn't there. But what I want you to know is that just looking at the, the few responses that we have here, you already acknowledge what the quote, best minds in the nation know and the world know when it comes to resiliency. So when we think about resiliency, there's three things that they, that they acknowledge, three components of resiliency that help all people flourish. Uh, um, the first is relationships, or the first is individual um, skills. So when we talk about this, we're talking about knowing that you're good at something, that you're worthy of love, that you do something and you do it well. That's one type of uh, skill. So if we're going to flourish, we as humans need to feel a sense of purpose. Like we have something to contribute, that we know that we can do something and we do it well. Um, <clears throat> so think about how you learned how to tie your shoe. And I think shoe tying is a great example. Um, I imagine, you know, if, if we were in a shared physical space, I'd ask you to raise your hands, but I can't see you, so we'll just pretend I haven't yet had the experience that everyone's hand goes up uh, or anyone's hand goes up, but anybody make their own pair of shoes, especially as a child, construct their own pair of shoes. No, right? Like we are always dependent upon access to resources uh, in order to, to even learn and grow. So the way you learned how to tie your shoe, you had to first have access to a shoe and you got that through your community, through, through some pathway, you had access to a shoe. But then in order to actually learn how to tie the shoe, it was through a process, through relationship with another human where they were, they were modeling it for you, you were practicing it, they were coaching you through the process, practice, modeling, coaching, and repetition. And it's through that process that you eventually learned how to tie your shoe. And then um, if I asked you all to raise your hands, right, like, who of you are shoe tires? I imagine every hand would go up. And if you're there and you're willing to do this with me, raise your hand because in, in your hand right here is the hand model of the brain. So we use this as a handy tool <laughs> to understand the neuroscience. This is the brain stem. This is our hippocampus and amygdala, the fight, flight, freeze, the emotional center of our brain. This is the planning, prioritizing, decision-making, um, all of the neural functions that we call executive functioning, emotion regulation, inhibition, inhibitory control, mental flexibility, uh, all of those things happen up here, including the neurons involved in helping you control your physical movements in order to, to learn and then tie your shoe. Those are all neurons that happen up here. And the, the ability to put the brakes on an emotional outburst or keep from, quote, flipping your lid is another critical individual skill. It's the skill that we call self-regulation. And it's important that we acknowledge that self-regulation is learned the exact same way that tying your shoe is learned, is that self-regulation, your ability to manage stress is a learned process through a process known as co-regulation, which means somebody else in through experiences and relationships with other humans, you have experience to somebody else experiencing stress, then modeling for you how to manage that stress. You're watching, you're practicing alongside them. Um, and we may not be explicit about coaching individuals and children about managing stress, but we are definitely implicit about how we respond to stress and we are teaching that to our kids and we're teaching that to the individuals and humans we have relationships with through this process of co-regulation. So one of the things that we acknowledged in here was individual skills. 
And that we learn that we're good at something that we're worthy of love, that we do something and we do it well through education opportunities, right? And we also get some encouragement. But another thing that's really critical, so that's one of the things that's really critical for us to flourish. Another thing that's really critical for us to flourish is relationships with caring and competent adults, or relationships with caring and competent people. Caring meaning that they show you love. <clears throat> competent meaning that they also keep you safe and meet your basic needs. Because you can have a relationship with somebody who shows you love, but then who also harms you emotionally, physically, sexually, or fails to provide for your basic needs. And those can be really challenging relationships to have. And then the third thing that we know all people need if they're gonna flourish is a connection to something larger than themselves. Connection, community, a sense of belonging, relationship with nature, so it's this belief that we exist in relationship with other humans. Those are the really critical things. <clears throat> okay, so if we back up a slide here. So <clears throat> those protective factors, those things over there, growing up in a household that you, you all described where you're, um, supported in developing your individual skills, where you have caring and competent relationships with caregivers, uh, uh, where you have caring and competent caregivers, and where you have a sense of community, a sense of belonging, a sense of connection to the broader community. Having those things uh, impacts your brain and body in such a way that you adapt, and you can see this imagery here that actually what happens is both your brain and your body adapt to those experiences, kind of pushing your fulcrum, the middle part of your teeter-totter, this direction, making you, quote, more resilient to those uh, other adverse experiences throughout the entire life course. Similarly, <clears throat> you described here some of the 10 adverse childhood experiences when you were describing the biggest concerns that you see impacting our community. So two of the 10 adverse childhood experiences are growing up in a household where there's substance use uh, or where there's um, mental health issues. And those were two things that were men mentioned. <clears throat> so the behavioral health world. So if you're growing up in a household where there's an adult who's struggling with mental health or substance abuse issues that are not, and they're not getting the uh, support and care and treatment to manage those effectively, those can impact our brains and bodies in a fundamental way. Uh, also, other things that um, child abuse and neglect as a form of trauma are other things that are included in those 10 adverse childhood experiences. But what I think is most in, important for us to acknowledge is that you as a community also pointed out numerous other experiences that are what the researchers would call toxic stress <laughs> uh, and these toxic stress experiences are, are um, and the reason why I start with this activity <laughs> is that you as a community already acknowledge that there are many other sources of potential toxic stress that uh, are not captured nicely in the, those adverse childhood experiences, those 10 categories that we're gonna touch on further here today. There's a reason why we need to still be continuously monitoring those 10 adverse childhood experiences, and we'll talk about that at length today. But I want us to also center the voice of our community, the wisdom of the humans that you're working with and acknowledging that their trauma and their traumatic experiences and the ones that may have fundamentally impacted the development of their brain and body may not fit nicely in a small list of 10 on one questionnaire. So we need to be continuously curious about the humans that we're working with and wondering uh, alongside them are there experiences of adversity that they had that so outweighed the protective things in their life that those experiences, and again, I think hopefully the imagery sits here with you, is that your fulcrum only moves when something outweighs the other side. What I mean by that is you could experience something traumatic, uh, being diagnosed with an illness as a young child, or growing up in a household where there's uh, physical abuse. You can experience something traumatic 
and it doesn't necessarily impact your developing brain, the, the neurons in your brain, or the expression of your DNA, if you have enough other things, an auntie, an uncle, grandma, loving neighbors, enough other things in your life, a coach, a sibling, who helps you navigate that traumatic event and keep it from fundamentally impacting your brain and developing body. So when we use the term toxic stress, what we're talking about is when experiences of adversity outweigh our ability and the amount of resiliency and supports that we have, and those experiences actually impact the development of our brain and the expression of our DNA, causing what they call a toxic stress impact. Okay, so um, that's the near sciences teeter-totter in a nutshell. Um, we're going to continue to reflect back on that imagery uh, because I think that it's something that may help us in understanding human behavior from a new context. But before we go further, and I've, I've already unpacked a little bit about the, the bundle of neuroscience. So when we say the neuroscience is teeter-totter, N stands for that brain in the middle, and neuroscience literally means the study of how our brain adapts to our lived experiences. E stands for epigenetics, which means on top of genetics, which means the study of how the expression of our DNA, which genes get turned up or turned down, turned on or turned off, depending upon our lived experiences. A stands for adverse childhood experiences or some of those uh, toxic stress experiences. And then R stands for resiliency, those protective factors that may uh, buffer us from having toxic stress experiences. Um, so, I want to set the context for how I want you to continue listening to the rest of this conversation and discussion. Uh, I believe that challenges exist on a continuum, and at one end, we have what we would call a routine challenge. A uh, routine challenge is a process, a procedure, you can become an expert at a routine challenge. It uh, doesn't necessarily mean that um, this challenge happens routinely. What it means is when you encounter this challenge, if you follow the routine, if you follow the steps in the exact same order, in the exact same way, you'll get the same result every single time. An example of that is baking a cake. And if you use the model that I do, which is add water, open box, add water, right? Even baking is optional at this point. <laughs> but hopefully you see how this is a simple routine challenge. My brother's a physicist. Um, so this is a much more complex or complicated routine challenge, but it's still a routine challenge. Meaning uh, he'd tell you it's just math, it's just physics. And if you follow the incredibly long list of the recipe for getting a rocket to the moon, um, you'll see that we can do this and we can replicate it over and over again because it's just a routine challenge. Now, I like to tease him and hopefully all of you have uh, people in your life that you like to tease as well. Uh, what I like to tease him about is that what I'm doing every single day and what I would argue all of you are doing every single day is much more difficult than getting a rocket to the moon. Because if you work with other humans, you're engaged in something that we would call as an adaptive challenge. If you're um, parenting, if you're teaching, if you're helping people on their health trajectory, um, you are working with humans. And what that means is that there's no real process, there's no procedure, and you can't really become an expert. You can become an expert on a disease, but what's constantly changing in that scenario is the actual human with the disease that's showing up in front of you. So if you're working with other humans and you're trying to help them on their journey to flourishing, you're engaged in an adaptive challenge. And adaptive challenges require this, what the Brie Collective is doing, which I think is really exciting is bringing humans together who do similar type of work to learn alongside one another. This is the process that we need. As a parent of a three-year-old and an eight-year-old, I need a network of other parents that I can reach out to, that I can get advice for, I can get support for. I can try something new, gather some basic data, come back around to get again and say, hey, I tried what you suggested, um, you know, it worked, it didn't work, but that we're, in, 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 that we're supported in trying to be innovative and trying to learn alongside the humans that we work with. <clears throat> I keep using the word human uh, and I do it with intention because I want you to acknowledge here and just take a second here 
I want you to acknowledge that uh, no matter the work that you do, I think there's two things that unite all of us. The first is that we're all humans. The second is that we all work with humans. But I also want to acknowledge that we haven't always defined human the same way throughout the course of American history. And there was a time um, not too long ago in our society when the definition of human, meaning full rights, privileges, and, um, and benefits of society, of citizenship, was narrowly uh, applied to white landowning males. And we need to acknowledge that because almost every system in our community has been impacted based on our understanding and definition of who is a human. And we see the lasting implications of that when we disaggregate out the data of any of our systems, we continue to see that the systems were built for our, and our first definition uh, when we were establishing this nation through colonization and slavery around who got to be a, a full human and a full person. <clears throat> and I share that because our mental model has evolved. We have shifted. And I, I believe we're in a point now in human history where we define humanity much more broadly. And we say that uh, not just white males who own land should have the full rights and privileges of citizenship and the full rights and privileges uh, of our society. So as our mental model has shifted, uh, it's time for us to also align our systems with that new mental model. And I share this construct, this term mental model, I use my glasses as a metaphor for it because when my glasses are really clean, I forget they're even on my face. And our mental model is our deeply held beliefs, assumptions, and values that influence the way we see the world, how we understand it, what we perceive and pay attention to. And um, I know most of you are healthcare professionals, so I apologize if I butcher this story or if I miss parts of this story that are really important. But I want you to reflect upon this public health story that many of you may re re already know. And it's the, the story of downtown London in the early 1850s and Dr. John Snow. And at the time, um, the best medical minds said miasma was decimating the, the population. That's what was causing the diseases that we saw. Miasma meant dirty air. The air that we were breathing in was killing us. <clears throat> so <clears throat> take a second here. You are living in downtown London. All of the best medical minds are telling you that the air is killing you. You're literally watching thousands of people die every single day. Your friends and family and neighbors. What are you gonna do to keep you and yourself and your family safe? I've been telling this story for the last five years in our community prior to COVID-19. I imagine that our behaviors would actually look much like our current understanding of how COVID-19 impacts our community. You would wear a mask. You would stay indoors. You would stay away from other people as much as possible. You would try to filter the air any way you could, and you would leave the area if possible. So if the, if the belief was it's the air in London that's killing us, then people would leave London. And, and, and acknowledgement around where we're at in the course of human history is that this is before we have invented indoor plumbing. Uh, so there's rivers of human sewage running through the streets of London. So it, it doesn't smell very nice. But you're Dr. Jon Snow and a new doctor. And even though everybody knows it's the air that's killing people, you are very thorough. You start working with patients. Unfortunately, your patients become ill. Uh, they succumb to their disease and they die. And you go ahead and do the autopsy. And if it's, if it's the lungs, if it's the air that's killing us, we would see all the symptoms in the lungs. But you cut open pair after pair of healthy lungs. There's, there's nothing in the lungs. You continue on the autopsy and you find all the concerns in the stomach. Well, how do things get to our stomach? through ingestion. We either drink it or we eat it. So you start doing some basic data collection. You start putting a red X next to the home address on every person that you work with who dies. And pretty soon you've got a whole bunch of red Xs around the Broad Street well. You walk down to the well, you look in the well, what's in the well? Human feces, dead bodies. I share this story because this is 
before we had the concept that water could transmit disease. I don't have to elaborate. All you need to know is that there's a new way of understanding the problem. Once you shift your perspective from the problem is the air to the problem is the water, we will invent brilliant, beautiful solutions. And that's the way I want us to think about this trauma-informed care movement, is that if you're looking for the recipe for what to do with the humans that you work with, you're listening for and looking for maybe the wrong thing. Instead, focus in on shifting your perspective and once you've shifted your perspective, you will invent brilliant, amazing solutions working alongside the humans that you work with as you've shifted your perspective from it's the air that's killing us to it's the water that's killing us. There's only two things you have to do during a public health crisis. Uh, I think we're doing both of these pretty effectively uh, during COVID-19. Uh, my hope is that we can take this same energy and apply it to adverse childhood experiences, another pandemic that's impacting our community. The first is tell everyone, right? So Dr. John Snow went door to door around the Broad Street well, knocking on doors saying, hey, you don't have to wear a mask. You don't have to leave London. Just stop drinking the water. Stop drinking the water. And the second thing you do is act in your own sphere of influence. So he had enough power that he was able to get the pump handle removed from the Broad Street well. So even people who wouldn't listen to him, he ended up saving their lives. <clears throat> so um, we're gonna continue on this journey around the near sciences and dive a little bit deeper. Again, um, it's neuroscience, epigenetics, adverse childhood experiences, and resiliency. So we wanna center this acknowledgement that uh, <clears throat> not all memories are the same, and some experiences literally kind of get underneath our skin, so to speak, and get stored in our bodies. Our brain has one responsibility and our brain's responsibility is survival. It's managing a continuous flood of sensory information about our internal and external environment and its lens, its perspective on the world is filtering out information based upon survival. So from that context, I wanna invite us to lean into thinking about two very different trajectories through the world. <clears throat> Across the top here, you see a little boy, I'm gonna call this little boy Johnny. And Johnny is exposed to danger. He's growing up in a household where there is physical sexual abuse, there's domestic violence. He grows up where he's, um, there's inconsistency in his caregiving due to substance use or mental health issues. So um, the depression of his caregivers, uh, whether it's during COVID and because of a uh, pandemic or other reasons, uh, his caregiver's depression for him feels like a stressful event because he'll ask for food, he'll seek engagement uh, by cooing and laughing and playing. And when uh, his caregivers are able to get their mental health needs met, they're engaging and loving and super responsive. And when they're overcome by their depression and anxiety, or whatever that makes that experience is, and they're unable to be as responsive as he's used to, his physiological experience of his caregivers not being able to consistently respond to his cues is a, a, an experience of being flooded with the stress hormones of cortisol, <coughs> uh, adrenaline, norepinephrine, and that those experiences activate that fight, flight, freeze response. It's critical that we learn to adapt to these sorts of dangerous responses. <clears throat> if we didn't, we would not survive. <clears throat> so I wanna invite in through the chat, if you were growing up in a household where you're continuously navigating a world where you're um, feeling unsafe, there's violence, there's physical or sexual abuse, um, you have caregivers with mental health or behavioral health issues. What are some behaviors or characteristics you may develop if you're growing up in a world where you're constantly living and experiencing fear, where you're constantly living in danger? Just throw it in the chat. What are some ways in which you may adapt? What are some behaviors or characteristics that may emerge if you're constantly navigating that world? Remain silent. Hoard food. Uh, 
Ah, create an alternative world. Beautiful. This concept around disassociate or check out, withdraw, hypervigilance, mistrust of people. Absolutely. If your association with humans has been that humans are a source of harm or a source of threat or a source of danger, you're going to adapt and develop the neural connections to tell you how to navigate danger. Self-preservation, distrustful, assuming blame, go it alone, absolutely. Independence, rugged independence, sure. Anxious, anxiety around connections. Aggressive, anger issues, yes. What I want us to acknowledge is that these are adaptive responses to constantly living in fear. And any of us who navigated a similar world where we're constantly inundated with fear would adapt similarly. If we didn't, we would not survive. I wanna acknowledge two other points. I appreciate the engagement in chat, please keep it coming. I wanna acknowledge two other things here. The fight, flight, and freeze, <clears throat> we're missing two there. Um, we should add fawn, which is that kind of dissociative response where you shut down entirely. Freeze is like you're immobile. Fawn is like you check out, you go into that alternate world, and that that is an adaptive response, and it helps you survive. Another one that we need to add, which is the first response that we go to neurologically, is to flock flock, come together. And for this, I want to use a quick story here. So, um, and I, I had an amazing uh, experience when I was doing a training and a participant came up to me and said, you know, um, and this is a story that she's given me permission to share. So she uh, had her first child at Harrison Hospital here in Bremerton uh, uh, in, in our community. And um, she brings her child home and they're really excited and her partner's really excited and partner also like uh, uh, most of us has no context around uh, child development and uh, no idea what to expect with a new infant and is feeling anxious and overwhelmed, uh, but does know that babies crawl. Now granted, this infant is minutes old and mom is trying to breastfeed, but dad wanting to be a loving doting father decides to start vacuuming. So that infant is in her arms, she's uh, breastfeeding, and the vacuum starts up. And that infant's immediate response is to look up at mom. And that immediate response is, is to flock. Because we have one of the longest, most vulnerable childhoods of any animal species. Meaning that we are incapable of fighting or fleeing on our own as infants. And we know that our survival is dependent upon connecting with another human to fight on our behalf, to take us with them if they run. So that infant hears the vacuum cleaner and looks at mom and says, mom, do we need to fight? Do we need to run? Obviously the infant doesn't say that, but with the eyes communicates, what are we gonna do? Are you gonna keep me safe? And mom's response, based on her own experience with vacuums, was to say, shh, it's okay. It's just daddy running the vacuum. She probably had some choice words for her partner around, I'm trying to breastfeed and now's not the time. But anyhow, she was able to communicate to her child, this is an okay noise. And mom's ability to regulate her stress in that moment helped build that child's experience regulating their response to stress. And, and I did the math and over the first two years of our partner breastfeeding our children, there were over 8,000 interactions in which their heart was pressed up against my partner's heart. And so if my partner is experiencing stress and they're overwhelmed, they are teaching that infant co-regulation, whether they want to or not, and our ability to regulate and navigate stress is something that we are teaching to our kids through that, those millions of interactions like that. Now let's envision a totally different life path. You're growing up in an environment where you're met with love and consistency and support, where each time you coo or cry, a caregiver coos or responds to your crying to see and respond to your needs. They change your diaper, they feed you, they engage with you. 
over those millions of interactions, what are some behaviors or characteristics you may develop if you're growing up in an environment like that, where you're, each time you try and engage with humans, your human responds to you with, uh, with connection and, and with meeting your basic needs. What are some behaviors or characteristics if you're experiencing that bottom life path? A, a sense of safety, compassion and trust, Beautiful. Uh, caring. You prioritize relationships. Confidence. Yeah. Look to others to get your needs met. Beautiful. Freedom to explore. Safe to fail. You can try things because you know that you have humans that are going to be there to pick you up, to catch you if you fall. You've had those repeated experiences. Smiling. Yeah. Your basic neurological orientation to the world is going to be that the world is safe. And so you're going to adapt and develop the neurological uh, connections that tell you, I navigate a safe world, that humans will help me no matter what happens. And so as long as I have other people that I can flock with, we can do this, we can get through it, I can overcome whatever this stressful experience may be. And this is critical because when conditions are good, these are the types of behavior patterns that we need in order for us to work together in an increasingly diverse world and come up to and develop solutions collectively. Beautiful, thank you for sharing and engaging in the chat. I deeply appreciate it. Uh, this, I'll be fully transparent, this webinar style of presentation is very dysregulating for me. That's why I'm audibly breathing and trying to stay connected here. So I miss seeing all your faces, but I love the connection through chat. So what I want us to think about here, oh, I gave it away. Um, let's imagine that you're on this top life journey. And, and what I want us to acknowledge is that we haven't used the words good or bad, is that both of these are adaptive responses to different lived experiences. And so you're this, this boy Johnny across the type life path, you've navigated lots of danger, you have a really strong fight, flight, and freeze response, you know how to respond in a moment of crisis, and you wanna join our community and flourish and, and contribute to our community. What kind of professions might you be well suited for? What kinds of professions are gonna use your skill set well? And again, I encourage your participation in chat. <clears throat> So one profession would be a firefighter, first responder, right? You respond well in a moment of crisis. Um, our police officers, our military, you have the neural skills to help you navigate dangerous experiences. What happens if you're this little boy or girl on the bottom life path and you've adapted, you've experienced safety and connection and support, You've developed the neural connections that tell you the world is safe and you want to join the military or become a firefighter or how do we help you develop those skills and capabilities to respond in a moment of crisis? Well, we send you to boot camp and think about what that experience looks like. The law enforcement training academy, uh, the medical residency process. What does that experience look like? I think the way, the reason why those experiences work, the reason why those are effective training environments are twofold. First and foremost, um, they are as safe as you can make, simulated war, fighting a fire, learning how to police, learning how to um, provide medical care. So safety, and I think safety is something that helps us learn. I think you can learn even if you don't feel safe, but I know that learning is easier and more of your brain can be devoted to learning when you know that um, you're safe, that, that the, there's lots of precautions put in place to, to enable you to learn. And then the second thing is the way in which we learn in those environments. It's through practice, modeling, coaching, and repetition. You learn how to be a firefighter because somebody else has got all the gear on in front of you. They've been doing it for many years. They're literally telling you in the moment what to do. You have all the gear on yourself. 
So you're practicing it, they're modeling it, and they're coaching you in the moment. And through repeated experiences, you develop those strong neural connections in your brain and the muscle twitch fibers so that you know how to respond in the moment of crisis. My question for all of us kind of rhetorically here is, where is the boot camp for individuals like Johnny to learn about people, process, and possibility? Where is the boot camp for him to learn about the skills of relationship? I would argue that the boot camp doesn't exist because we fundamentally believe, and we've created most of our systems to suggest that everyone is experiencing safety and everyone's experiencing that bottom life path. And if they show up in the environment that you work in and they have some of the behavior patterns that you describe, where they're anxious, they're aggressive, uh, they shut down, they run away, whatever that looks like, if they show up with those behaviors, we tend to respond to them from a context of shame, blame, punishment, fault. We try and uh, coach those behaviors. We try and punish those behaviors. We try and find some way to address those behaviors. But oftentimes we're failing to understand that those behaviors have served that human well in another setting. So it comes down to when our biological adaptations collide with the expectations of society. So Johnny's adapted well to navigate a dangerous environment. And now he's in a kindergarten classroom and his behavior patterns may make it really difficult for him to form and maintain relationships with his peers, to navigate relationships with others. So I'm gonna keep moving us forward. Amy, I'd love a time check, just a reminder about when we're ending. Yes, you have until 4.20, so you have about 40 minutes left. Beautiful, okay. Uh, that's good. So we'll fly through epigenetics, mainly because I don't understand it very well. <laughs> uh, so there's a lot going on in this slide uh, that I want us to understand. And I think about this like um, the recipe, the cookbook for you, because the recipe for your skin cell, blood cell, eye cell, liver cell, hair cell, eye cell, every cell in your body, the recipe for every cell in your body is wrapped up in this massive uh, molecule, which is the, our chromosome. And, and it's bundled, uh, you kind of see the imagery here is a bunch of balls wrapped around those little orange things. Those are called histones or proteins. And so, um, so I, again, I like to think of it like the cookbook for you. And so for a colorful illustration of epigenetics, you need look no further than my beard. You can probably see here that the color's changing a little bit. My gene hasn't changed. Uh, I inherited brown hair. This is great great grandma's recipe. Uh, sorry kids, right? I've already passed on brown hair to both of my children. This is the recipe that I had to offer. It's the only recipe that I have in my cookbook, so to speak. But, so my gene hasn't changed, but my experiences, my lived experiences have influenced the ingredients that my body has to cook with, so to speak and it has turned up or turned down or turned on or turned off some of the genes in my brain and in my body so that when my brain uh, and gets the signal that it's time for a new hair cell, hair follicle to grow on my chin, um, and it flips to that page in the recipe book for hair cell and uh-oh, we ran out of the ingredients for brown and now we're doing gray or white or we're doing none at all. Yay, epigenetics. Uh, right? So at an individual level, it's maybe infuriating. At a population level, there's some immense value to this. So for this, I'm just going to quickly use a, a story around the Holocaust. Um, during the Holocaust, there were a group of women who got pregnant or got pregnant shortly thereafter. <clears throat> and if you think about that, it's one of the most horrific uh, circumstances imaginable. They were being uh, essentially experiencing starvation um, and lots of other forms of trauma. So at the moment of conception, that infant knew that if it was gonna survive, it had to adapt because it was growing up in a time of extreme famine. There's no food, there's no water. So there was a metabolic change, an epigenetic change impacting their metabolism so that those children would be able to pack away every grain of rice, every ounce of bread or water that they had to help them survive an extreme famine. This adaptation was critical. They would not have survived childhood without that adaptation. 
across the life course, that adaptation may become a health complication. We now have uh, data on the children, grandchildren, and even great-grandchildren of those same uh, women who survived the Holocaust, and their children have struggled with alarming rates of obesity and diabetes compared with the uh, general population. In, in the short term, that epigenetic change helped those immediate ancestors survive a famine. Over the life course, 50, 60, 70 years, those adaptations may become a health complication. So epigenetics is the science that helps uh, us understand this construct around what we call intergenerational transmission of trauma or intergenerational trauma or historical trauma. And I think we need to hopefully have a little bit more empathy and understanding both for our own health trajectory is that you may be literally carrying with you the trauma of some of your ancestors and that may be influencing your own health trajectory and then extend that empathy out to others that you're working with because maybe there's something that their ancestors experienced that is inf influencing their health as well. <laughs> So I'm gonna rapidly fly through the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study here. Um, it's the largest study of its kind, over 17,000 individuals, predominantly white, wealthy, and highly educated uh, in, the San in the San Diego area through the Kaiser Permanente Healthcare Plan. Um, it's been replicated, uh, this is actually more than 150 times now, across the globe. And every time that, we've, uh, that they've done the study, they've seen higher rates of adversity, largely because they've seen a more representative sample of the community. This sample was predominantly white, wealthy, and highly educated because those were the humans who had access to Kaiser Permanente, a healthcare plan, a preventative healthcare plan um, in the early 1990s. So I share with you the construct, is that the doctors who started this research, Dr. Robert Ender and Dr. Vincent Felitti, who I've had the pleasure of working alongside, um, their construct was, their entire mental model as epidemiologists was, if, if we um, can predict it, we can prevent it. And their, their orientation to the world was as a researcher's perspective. So um, the reigning belief when they started this work was people were doing things that were bad for their health. They were engaging in high risk health behaviors because they just didn't know. And then they were developing diseases associated with their behaviors and then they were dying because of those diseases. An example of this would be the work around um, smoking, right? Um, I think it's impossible to not have heard that smoking kills. But I imagine, and I know that when I do this in front of an audience, if I ask you to raise your hands, uh, almost all of us would raise our hands indicating that we ourselves or know someone in our lives who smoke. And we also acknowledge that it's impossible that they don't know about the health risk concerns. So when we acknowledge that there's something else driving behavior, it's not just people don't know, but there's some other thing that's driving behavior and that's where we uncover the rest of this adverse childhood experiences pyramid. And there's another layer here that says historical trauma and social context, as well as your own adverse childhood experiences influence the, your development uh, neurons in your brain. And we already talked about that. And that those developing neurons uh, lead you down uh, different types of behaviors. And you already surfaced some of those behaviors, uh, those cognitive, social, and emotional um, and capacities that then lend you down a pathway to either engaging in health risk behaviors or not. I also want to acknowledge that ACEs is not predictive. What I mean by that and it is that um, if I tell you I have an ACE score of zero or an ACE score of four, it doesn't tell you anything about me as an individual because ACEs are only one small part of that teeter-totter that we drew at the beginning. ACEs only capture 10 of the potential sources of toxic stress. There's other potential sources of toxic stress. The ACEs questionnaire doesn't ask anything about epigenetics, so you don't know what my ancestors experienced that is also impacting my health. It doesn't tell you anything about the age I was when I experienced the type of abuse or neglect, and the type of abuse or neglect also impacts our brains and bodies very differently. It also doesn't tell you anything about the other things over here that, that might have balanced out my teeter-totter, so to speak. But at a population level, we start to see patterns. So again, those 10 adverse childhood experiences in, from the original study, these are the rates that we see. 27% said that they grew up in a household where there was substance abuse, 
28% said that they grew up in a household where there was physical abuse. 21%, one in five said that they grew up in a household where there was sexual abuse. So the researchers created this list of 10 based on what we were trying to prevent in the early 1990s. But what's really powerful and profound that we need to pay attention to is that what sets the adverse childhood experiences study apart from any other study prior is rather than focusing on any one of these 10 adverse events, they focused on the overall accumulation of adversity. So rather than focusing on the severity of the emotional abuse, they paid attention to was there emotional abuse and emotional neglect? Was there emotional abuse, emotional neglect, and domestic violence in the household? So uh, for a potential, th th that's why they came up with this score category concept. And, and it's really thinking about the total number of bricks, so to speak, on that teeter-totter that I showed you earlier. <clears throat> and, and I think uh, from 10 years in child welfare, I can share with you confidently, I never once worked with a family where there was one, only one adverse childhood experience. I might've got a call from a concerned nurse or a doctor who said, hey, this bruise, uh, doesn't line up with the family's uh, description of the events. So I would go to do an investigation about concerns about physical abuse. But there was always something else happening in the household. Domestic violence, substance use, mental health issues, poverty, homelessness. In fact, 87% of the time when there's one adverse childhood experience, there's another. So here's the original data that we saw. 33% of those individuals who responded to the first survey, those 17,000 predominantly white, wealthy, and highly educated individuals, 33% said that they had zero of those 10 adverse childhood experiences. That means the overwhelming majority, 67% had one or more adverse childhood experiences. 16% had four or more of those adverse childhood experiences. And there's this dose response relationship. Again, think about it, the number of bricks you put on that teeter-totter, the higher the other end shoots up, or the more gallons of gas you put in your car, the more miles you can drive. The same is true as we increase our toxic stress dose, there is a, a, a corresponding uh, connection to health and social challenges where we're more likely to experience health and social challenges across the life course. Uh, this is one of my favorite slides here because uh, this is the slide that helped me shift my perspective and my mental model. So we're looking at um, early smoking, we're looking at um, current smoking, and then individuals who said they'd already developed a disease associated with smoking called COPD. So, um, <clears throat> and we're looking at ACE scores going from zero with the lightest color to four more with the darkest color of blue there. <clears throat> so if it was just about access to cigarettes, meaning what you experienced in your household, your earliest childhood experiences, if those didn't influence your behavior, if, it, if your relationship with smoking was just about education and access to cigarettes, we would see no difference at a population level around the percentage of humans that start smoking. Um, because all of these humans were in the, essentially in the same uh, community with same access and information around smoking. But what you see is you go from less than four individuals, less than 4% of individuals with an A score of four start smoking daily before age 12. That's what early smoking initiation means. To nearly 13 or 14% of individuals with an A score of four or more start smoking daily before age 12. Okay, so let's think about this for a moment. You are 11 and you're growing up in a household where there is physical and sexual abuse. There's mental health issues, there's domestic violence, and there's substance use. You have an A score of five. Please use the chat. What does it feel like to be, to be 11 in that household? I'm not seeing anything in the chat. Amy, I can't get my chat window to pop up, so uh, 
Yeah. I'm out for you. I'm seeing, um, where are my drugs? Uh, overwhelming, frightening, unsafe and unstable. You spend a lot of energy pretending to be okay while you are at school. So nobody knows unsafe, um, overwhelming. Thank you for that. Thank you, Amy. Appreciate it. Um, Thank you everyone for engaging in that way. I don't know what happened in my chat window. So I really appreciate this. And this, this was my experience is that um, we were, my partner was driving and we're uh, traveling down the road and we see three teenagers standing on the street corner smoking cigarettes. And my immediate gut response was, what the blank is wrong with them? Don't they know smoking kills? And then I paused my judgment for a moment and I reflected, I wonder what they've experienced. I wonder what's happened to them. I continued on this line of thinking and I said, I wonder what, I wonder what smoking does for them. And so I pulled out my phone, my smartphone, and I Google searched the neurological impacts of nicotine on the brain. And you just described what it feels like to be 11 in that household. It's anxious, it's depressing, it's scary. Well, guess what nicotine does to our brain? It causes the release of those quote, feel good chemicals in our brain that actually reduce our sense and perception of anxiety and depression. It actually floods our brain with those feel-good chemicals like norepinephrine, serotonin, and dopamine, which help us improve our concentration and focus. It also actually temporarily binds to the pain receptors in our brain, inhibiting our ability to experience or feel pain. So who's ready for a cigarette? Uh, these are not, smoking is not the only thing that causes that release of feel-good chemicals in our brain. In fact, if it feels good, it's using those same neural pa neurochemical pathways in our brain. So what are the things that feel good that help you feel well? Amy, I, again, I may need you to read or I can stop my share maybe and get the chat. No, I'm, I'm happy to do yeah. whatever is easier for you. So um, share with me. What are the things that help you feel like uh, release those feel-good chemicals? What helps you feel good? If you do it and it makes you feel good, it's probably activating those same neurochemicals. These are what Dr. And and Dr. Robert, uh, Dr. And and Dr. Vincent Felitti identified as personal solutions to traumatic experiences. Dancing, nature, sweets, yeah, chocolate, dark chocolate, <laughs> a sense of community, Relationships with friends, exercise, running, coffee, yoga, yoga and chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> Together, yoga and chocolate, dancing, horseback riding, meditation, mindfulness, yoga, journaling, prayer. Guess what? The neurons in your brain don't care what you call it, but the experience of reflecting upon your own experience, reflecting upon your thoughts, that can be a really uh, powerful thing. Mona, I really appreciate that you acknowledge breathing. Because breathing is the first thing that gets disrupted when we're feeling a sense of stress and anxiety. Art, movies, culture, music, those things, creating them or experiencing them, appreciating them are really, really powerful ways to activate those, that flood of experiences in our brain and bodies. Uh, I also need to acknowledge and um, that um, these have different intensity levels, right? Like your favorite movie may feel this good, release this much. Your favorite meal, depending upon, you can tell my relationship with food, right? <laughs> my, my favorite meal is better than my favorite movie. But if you've had heroin, right, it's up there. Um, and one of the toxic stress impacts and the way that our brain adapts to navigating a traumatic and dangerous childhood is that your brain says, we don't have a lot of these feel-good experiences. We don't need as many neurons or neurochemicals communicating these messages. We need to devote more of our brain garden, so to speak, and the real estate in our brain to navigating and responding to stress because we have lots of stress. So we need to know how to navigate and respond to it rapidly. So one of the toxic stress impacts is that individuals that have experienced lots of adversity, they may actually produce fewer of those feel good chemicals naturally. 
And that may lead them down a pathway where they're trying to activate the release of the chemicals through external stimulation, through the use of drugs, alcohol, or overindulgence in any of these pathways. For me, uh, mine was eating foods high in fat and sugar. I was 320 pounds when I was working in child welfare. I would eat the trauma history of every client that I worked with. That was the way that I processed the trauma that I was experiencing, either individually, uh, firsthand, or through my work with them, secondary trauma, uh, whatever you want to call it. Physiologically, my body was experiencing, because I was in relationship and trying to empathize with them, my body was experiencing their pain as, it, as my own pain. I was experiencing their stress as being stressful. And my coping mechanism was to, to uh, overindulge in, in foods that were high in fat and sugar. So um, I'm going to keep us moving here as rapidly as I can. So I'm um, just giving you some window into the prevalence of vases in our community. Um, <clears throat> So 62% of people in Washington state reported that they had at least one of those adverse childhood experiences. We are actually capturing new data right now in 2018, 19, and 2020. We are capturing new data on adverse childhood experiences through our behavior risk factor surveillance survey. It's a telephone-based survey. Two things you need to know about the data is that um, it's a phone survey, and we know that people tend to under-report their experiences of adversity they're much more likely to not tell you about their childhood trauma than to elaborate and say that they experienced child abuse or neglect when they did not. The second thing you need to know is that we're not even asking about all 10 of the adverse childhood experiences. We're not asking about physical or emotional neglect. The two leading reasons why we have child welfare involvement with families is concerns around neglect. So if you look at these numbers and they're concerning, uh, I think you should also be concerned that this is, if anything, an underrepresentation of the adversity we see in our community. And there is variation across our community. So we're looking at um, regions in our community, green being um, 11 to 21% of those regions reporting three or more adverse childhood experiences, red being 39 to 51% of those red shaded areas, the adults 18 and older were reporting three or more adverse childhood experiences. And then uh, not only are some members of our community experiencing three or more adverse childhood experiences, but now we're looking at a data point where individuals said that they were experiencing six or more adverse childhood experiences. And now that red shaded area, 12 to 22 percent of those communities, the adults in those communities are saying that they experienced six or more of those 10 adverse childhood experiences. <clears throat> Again, there is this strong relationship between ACE exposure and lifelong health and social challenges. So I built these slides all pre-COVID, but I think it's re resonant now. I'm assuming all of you have seen this slide um, or you've had experience with this hand-washing slide. And the reason why our Centers for Disease Control, the World Health Organization, invests so much in hand hygiene and hand washing and educating our community about it is because we understand the relationship between <clears throat> disease transmission and germ transmission and disease and hand washing. In fact, this is based on the reason why we have hand washing uh, education out there is that 5% of the flu is associated with people who just don't wash their hands. Notice I said associated. We acknowledge that washing your hands or not washing your hands does not cause the flu. We understand that there's a relationship though with the germs that cause the flu, that if you don't wash your hands, there's what they call this population of trivial risk. So Dr. Rob Anda um, had worked at the CDC for 20 years. For 20 years, he'd run a population attributable risk calculation, and he had never, not once, seen a number above 5%. 5% is the magic number within the CDC. When you see 5% of a disease or health condition in the population being associated with a singular thing, that is really powerful and profound. So he shares openly that uh, he ran this data analysis with the ACEs data, 
and he started to weep because this is what he saw. 61% of incarceration of adults is associated with adverse childhood experiences. The lowest number on here, 14% of individuals not graduating from college or technical school, not finishing their medical certification program, 14% of that is associated with adverse childhood experiences. 78% of IV drug use, 67% of suicide attempts. <clears throat> so it doesn't matter which slice of the pie you're most passionate about. This is why we call ourselves Kitsap Strong, is that it doesn't matter what we're passionate about, what area or sector we're working in in the community, we are all connected through this oil slick in the middle. And as we as a community collaborate and work together to try and prevent adversity in the next generation, we can shrink ACEs in our community, and we can lead to major cost savings in every one of these areas. But even if we're not effective at shrinking and reducing ACEs, I know that we can because I've seen other communities do it, but even if we're not effective at shrinking ACEs in, our, in the next generation, by building resiliency, and what I mean by that is the type of relationships between adults and parenting adults that support them through these challenges, we can help all people flourish. So I'm gonna skip this slide. <clears throat> um, what we've talked about is an acknowledgement that stress and our experience of stress send us down two very different trajectories. If stress is um, predictable, moderate and controlled, we develop what Dr. Bruce Perry calls neurological resilience, which means our experience with stress helps us build the capabilities to navigate future stressful experiences. We've had, we've had stress, but the stress has been predictable. It's been moderate. We've had other people there to help us navigate that stressful experience. And, and we've had some sense of control over it, knowing that it'll end. And that's led to this neurological orientation around resilience. Uh, he uses the word vulnerability very differently than like Brene Brown talks about vulnerability. We're talking about neurological vulnerability. So if you've exposed to and been exposed to repeated experiences of stress where the stress was unpredictable, like the stress of child abuse and neglect, it's unpredictable, it's severe and it's prolonged, you can become vulnerable to that and it can, it can have really uh, profound health consequences and implications. I shared this slide, the reason I wanted to keep this in here is I've heard lots of conversations around this pandemic and how people are navigating the pandemic. And I want to just bring and center this concept is that not every family is navigating the COVID-19 crisis the same way. For some families, uh, depend upon their family structure and the resources that they have and what's happening for them, this may be something that they can predict, that they feel a sense of control around that they, they haven't had such significant loss of family income that it's disrupting everything in their life, and that this will be another growth-promoting, stressful experience. So yes, it's stressful, but it's not fundamentally changing the architecture of their brain or impacting the expression of their DNA and leading to um, toxic stress. I also want to acknowledge that there are other members of our community where the stress of COVID-19 or the stress of social isolation and our way of navigating COVID-19 may be leading to this orientation around vulnerability. And I'm very concerned about how we are helping parents feel supported so that parents can care for their children. Because I think that back to that conversation I was having earlier about kids are learning how to navigate and respond to stress through co-regulation with their caregiver. If their caregiver is feeling totally overwhelmed with COVID and their social isolation, it, is, it could be a potential source of toxic stress or it could be tolerable depending upon how we as a community support families through this. But I, I really want us to be mindful of and paying attention to parenting adults because that's a high leverage solution. By paying attention to supporting parents, you have a dual generation opportunity where you can help the parents build through co-regulation the skills that their children will need to develop an orientation to stress that they have the, the capabilities to navigate future stressful pandemics. Um,
Thank you. I know that we have time, and I do want to acknowledge as well, and I really appreciate the comment. Um, I want to acknowledge that uh, racism, uh, sexism, any of the isms have the potential for being toxic um, <clears throat> based on the experiences that those humans have navigating a community and whether their experiences of oppression and discrimination are um, overwhelming to their brains and bodies or whether they have other resources, relationships and supports to help those repeated exposures from becoming toxic to their brains and bodies. And there's some amazing um, research and, and data that I think we need to lean into and look at around infant mortality rates and maternal mortality in our community. That is a really um, strong argument for the toxic stress impacts of racism and colonization on members of our community. So I appreciate that comment and I don't have the time to do it luxury and I'm even skipping our stretch break. I apologize. Um, I'm going to keep us moving into trauma-informed care and wrap up here um, and I can I'd stay on a little bit for questions uh, uh, and, and create that space. But a, a really trauma-informed perspective is fundamentally about us shifting our own perspective and engaging um, from this uh, shifting from what's wrong with you to a what's happened to you context. <clears throat> and acknowledging that all of us adapt to and respond to stress differently. So I wanted to just um, use this slide as a way to understand this new concept around polyvagal theory. And we don't have enough time to dive into it deeply, but I want you to know that the way that you show up in relationships and support families that you work with right now matters. Um, so polyvagal theory is this concept around the vagus nerve, which connects our our brainstem to our lungs to our heart and to our stomach it's the largest nerve in our body and we go into that fight flight and freeze response it's the vagus nerve that is activated our vagus nerve is also helping us scan the environment and perceive safety so if you've ever heard this statement um, trust your gut i think that's uh, what we've always known to be true is that we're constantly assessing safety and we may sense that something is unsafe, even if we don't have words or um, any way of knowing it, we just feel it in our body that the situation is unsafe. <sighs> the reality of, the, um, of mirror neurons and other things in our brain uh, suggests that we meet empathy with empathy, we meet aggression with aggression. What I mean by that is the way that we physically engage in and bring ourselves into the space whether we are cool and composed, uh, like Dwight here, the one on the left, or whether we're screaming like Michael uh, Scott, the one on the far right, our experience, our language, our, our tone of voice, our body posture, our breathing are all things that individuals can pick up on. Our smile are things that are communicating whether or not we are someone that that other human can flock with or whether they're perceiving us as unsafe. And so as mindful as we can be about the way that we are um, breathing air into the situation, the way that we are navigating that situation is really important to be considering. I think that polyvagal theory is the science behind de-escalation. And I would highly encourage you to try and do some research and explore further about what polyvagal theory means, um, because I think it has a profound implication for the healthcare uh, and the way in which the powerful and profound impact that just a smile and your presence, your tone of voice, your body language and posture can communicate a sense of safety and sense of connection with the other human that's there who probably is under immense levels of stress if they're in the healthcare setting that you're working in, just knowing how they ended up being there in the first place. Um, so I'm gonna, um, I apologize, I'm gonna skip through these two. So um, thinking about well, no, I'm gonna go back to this, sorry. So, um, yeah. So I'm gonna use a story here about my own family's health trajectory. When our son was six weeks old, we ended up in an ER um, because of concerns about our son's fever. <clears throat> and we're in the ER. And in the moment, these are all the elements of executive functioning. Um, and when we're under high levels of stress, people, quote, flip their lid, and these things go offline. 
So my partner and I are there, we're in the ER, and this is what happens when you flip your lid. Your processing load goes offline, which means how much information you can retain kind of gets significantly reduced. Our ability to think and remember and hear the verbal information that's being communicated to us is drastically reduced. Our working memory, that chalkboard, uh, that, okay, what did they say and, and what can I take action on? So um, for this story, my, my partner and I are there and we're in a hospital in our community trying to get care for our six week old and, and we are under immense stress. We're very, very concerned. And the medical professionals are telling and communicating to us the steps that they need to take. They were very concerned about his fever. They were concerned that he may have uh, meningitis and they didn't know uh, whether it was viral or bacterial, so they needed to do a spinal tap. Um, so the doctors communicated this to us and then they left the room and left my partner and I there. And we were flooded. We couldn't remember what had been said. We didn't know what, all we had heard was spinal tap. All we had thought about was a needle going into our tiny infant's back and we were just freaking out. And something about the interaction didn't feel right to us. So we said we wanted to go and we wanted to transfer our care to another hospital in our community. They were concerned, I think rightfully so, and they didn't know that we truly wanted to go to the other hospital. And so they arranged a, a ambulance to transport us to the other hospital. We showed up and we engaged in and had a very different feel. The actual physical environment was structured differently. One of the most important things that I acknowledged was there was a, a whiteboard on the wall. And as the doctor was talking to us, a nurse was writing up on the wall, the bullet point information about what the information that they were being communicated to us. <clears throat> they came in and sat down with us and uh, had a conversation seated instead of standing. Body language, tone of voice, posture, Everything about the interaction felt a little bit different. Medically, they redid everything that happened at the first hospital. What I want you to know is that that first interaction, those doctors did everything medically exactly the way that we experienced it at the second hospital. But what was fundamentally different was the approach and that we felt seen and heard in that second environment. And they also did tiny changes to the physical layout that acknowledge that when people are under stress, they can't remember what you just said. They know that our, my brain's working chalkboard is gone, so they literally put a chalkboard or a whiteboard in the room with the bullet point information. We were in the hospital for five days with our son, and that whiteboard became a source of continued support throughout that conversation because throughout those five days, we continued to struggle to hear and retain the information that doctors would tell us verbally, but we would remember and our memories would flash on the conversation when we'd look over at the whiteboard and see the bullet point information being written there. This is just one example of how a trauma-informed environment feels so different for the human that is receiving care, and there's very tiny, subtle shifts that are super profound. So I'm gonna end with this acknowledgement that a trauma-informed community is one that realizes the prevalence of trauma. Knowing that 60% of our adults experience one of those 10 adverse childhood experiences. So you know, you're working with humans, the majority have experienced some sort of childhood adversity and that's not asking about adult adversity. We also recognize how all of this affects us. <clears throat> And we work to intentionally try and resist re-traumatization. Uh, that can be through simple and subtle things that we shift about our practices and procedures that uh, prioritize safety and enable people to feel seen and heard. Uh, because as Dr. Bessel van der Kolk says, the greatest gift we can offer to another human is seeing them truly and deeply. And I can share with you that my experience in that second hospital, while medically they provided the exact same care they provided to our son in the first hospital, my experience was profoundly different. Our family's experience was profoundly different because we felt seen and heard, and that's an incredible gift that you offer.
So I think that we are at time. Um, let me know, Amy, how we're doing here. I think we are at time, though. We do have um, a minute or two. We haven't had any questions come in for a while, but at the very beginning of your presentation, there was one that came in, I wrote down, that asked um, for behavioral health providers who are not in person with their client, how does co-regulation supportive of client needs occur in these current times? Wow, beautiful. Uh, we need a whole other day for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, um, I think the best I could offer is what I've tried to model here for you as we've engaged in this virtual dynamic, is to be explicit about what you're doing to help yourself regulate and encourage them to do the same sort of activities. So you could do breathing and intentionally incorporate breath work. You could be intentional about if, it's, if they have the capability of, um, of even walking around their environment while connecting with you virtually, so that you're encouraging physical body movement while they're doing it. These are some of the many regulation strategies that we know can work. And just by you modeling it and encouraging it and creating space for that, um, that could be one way in reinforcing this regulation. I think the thing we need to know about regulation is um, that it's much like going to the gym um, and that the neurons in your brain, those ones that are the strongest connections are the ones that are going to become your default connection. So if you want those strongest connections to show up, you've got to do it through repetition. You've got to make those stronger. So um, I would argue that rather than doing 15 minutes of meditation twice a week, try three minutes of meditation three times a day. And the more we do it, the more times we're doing it, the more you're activating that neural network, the stronger those regulation skills are gonna become. So the more you could do that, I don't think virtually um, we have the ability to offer co-regulation in the same way. So I think we have to be more explicit about modeling it and encouraging people to engage in it. That's great. Cody, thank you so much. And um, thank you for being um, flexible in the lack of white at the beginning. And just really, really appreciate this wealth of knowledge. And for people have asked prior, prior, we will be sharing um, Cody's slides as well as some supplemental resources with the, the um, information that I push out later this week along with our evaluation survey. And yeah, just thank you again, Cody. This, is, this has really been great. Yeah, thank you, Amy. Yes, in the, in the materials, you'll see um, a, a, a bunch of handouts that we typically give out at a training that has um, shared language that we use today. Um, the the a version of the PowerPoint with a narrative to it. Uh, you'll get a PDF version of the PowerPoint, but as you saw today, many of those are pictures. So the other version provides a little bit more of the context behind it. Um, and then there's a great uh, handout that we really love that's uh, titled Working with uh, People When They're Under High Levels of Stress. And I think that will be um, maybe the closest to a recipe that you could think of as far as bringing this back and, and implementing some immediate work is to take that document and think about which of these strategies can I use? What are the tips that, that I can use? And it's 10 simple tips that really help uh, people when they're under stress. Great. Excellent. Thank you, Cody. I'm going to turn pleasure. it over. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciated the opportunity to share. Yeah, we appreciate having you. Have a great day. Yeah, you as well. And I'll let Ginny take it from here. I'm going to share my screen for one last uh, fun word cloud while Ginny closes us out. Thanks, Amy. And thank you, Cody. And thank you to all of our speakers today. We're really appreciative of your time and your presence here. So uh, up on the screen, you'll see a word cloud. We love word clouds here at the Brie. Uh, and I've even used them in Zoom baby showers. So applicable to every situation, right? And remember, if you're doing a two word answer, please use a hyphen so it is stuck together. So I'm, I'm reflecting on what I've heard today, and I'm thinking of uh, Maya Angelou's famous quote, do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. And thinking about 
what we've learned, telehealth on trauma-informed care, and how we want to take that and do better. I'm also thinking about how our re-collaborative can do better to address clinician suicide. I really think there are some good next steps that our group and our community can really do there. I'm also thinking about my professional and personal life. I have a two-year-old, so stress management is a, a big part of what we're working on right now, including not hitting other kids when that other kid has something that she wants. And some people, of course, never get past that stage of being two years old, but I think as a state that we can, I think we can take some of what we've learned on resilience and empathy and build a healthcare system that truly is trauma-informed, that truly does meet people where they're at and help address all this additional stress, depression, anxiety that we are all feeling as a result of this pandemic that we are living through. So I'll thank you all for your time and for your presence today. This is again the first of our two virtual summits. Our second is Tuesday, next Tuesday, June 23rd at 8.30 in the morning. And a large part of this day will be focused on developing action steps for individuals, for you as representatives from your organizations, and really moving forward and building a better healthcare system. So I will Thank you, and I will wish everybody a, a good night and good health, and I hope to hear and see you all next Tuesday. And we can leave the, the screen up as you think and reflect uh, on what we've all heard. Thanks, everyone.